Okay, good morning, everyone. Hello and welcome. My name is Elizabeth Brown. It is National Invasive Species Awareness Week, and I'm here to host today's special event with USGS. I'm really excited for today's event. This is a unique opportunity to hear about bi biological threat surveillance tools and to really get to learn the stories of how these things are being created and to try to make real connections in terms of what we need in the field and how we get it out there so that we can stop the spread of invasive species. And this is an outstanding lineup of speakers. Like this is absolutely phenomenal. So I'm really excited that USGS um, asked NASMA to help host this event. So anyway, again, my name is Elizabeth Brown. I'm your professional development, legislative affairs and certified weed-free products program manager here at NASMA. And this is National Invasive Species Awareness Week. So for those of you that don't know NASMA well, our mission is to support, promote, and empower invasive species prevention and management in North America. Just a little bit about what we do. We're the stewards of international standards, education, and advocacy through this week and all year long with our legislative committee. As soon as we wrap up NISA, we're moving into Play Clean Go Awareness Week in June, which is our public education and outreach campaign. And of course, we value providing professional development opportunities to the invasive species community, including our annual conference. Just want to plug that, save the date, September 27th through 30th in Montana or online if you're not able to travel. So with that, I want to get right to the heart of today's presentations. I want to turn it over to Cindy Tam with the USGS. She's going to be leading today's um, event along with several other moderators. So go ahead, put your Q&A. If you have questions, we'll do questions at the end of each session. Put your Q&A, uh, your questions in the Q&A box. We'll also be monitoring the chat, but it helps us stay organized if the questions go in the Q&A box. Take a look in there and just click the like button if you see a question that you want to ask as well, and that'll promote it to the top of the queue. Okay, with that, Cindy, it is all yours. Take it away. Thank you, Elizabeth. So I'm Cindy Kohler Tam, and I'm the program coordinator of the USGS Biological Threats and Invasive Species Research Program. And we're really happy to be uh, participating in National Invasive Species Awareness Week, part two. And we today are going to be focusing on our biosurveillance tools. USGS is the science branch of the Department of the Interior, and our mission is to provide information, tools, and data to land and water managers to inform the decision making that, that they do on a daily basis. <laughs> Always wishing they had more information, I'm sure. So USGS does a lot of biosurveillance throughout the country and our, our scientists work very closely with land and water managers and regulators as well. And so that's what we're going to be focusing on today. Most of the talks are going to be directly about invasive species. We have a few talks on wildlife disease of which they're, they're not native to the, to the country either. And we're gonna have several kind of like little mini sessions that are gonna be moderated by folks that are in the USGS uh, Biological Threats Program as well. So with that, I think we can start. And first up is Wes Daniel. Wes, take it away. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Cindy. Good morning. I'm Dr. Wesley Daniel. I'm the coordinator for the Non-Indigenous Aquatic Species NES database, and I'm coming to you from Gainesville, Florida, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the NES database and how we contribute to the USGS Biosurveillance Network. So um, I'm going to start off by providing you with just a general overview about the database. Uh, the figure that we have on the slide here is an adaptation of the Lodge and All 2006 Invasive Species Invasion and Management Model. The most effective way and efficient way to deal with non-native and potentially invasive species is to prevent their introduction into new watersheds. The NES database is one of the sources of information <coughs> that help with management and decision making. We really help at this beginning part. We aid in prevention by providing a single location for the collection, analysis, and dissemination of information about the presence and distribution of non-native aquatic species and their effects. The database provides information to evaluate the potential next invaders in the U.S. and how non-native species are currently within the U.S. could potentially spread. 
The database is also a central platform that can disseminate information about all confirmed sightings and impacts of, to interested parties, allowing for early detection and the potential for, to trigger rapid responses. And of course, it's always easiest to eradicate a new population before it becomes established. Now, a little history. The origins of the database you can see here was a pen board in Gainesville. The analog here were just color pens representing various species. At first, it was a fish focused database, but with the passage of the Non-Indigenous Aquatic Nuisance Species Control and Prevention Act in 1990, we expanded to include zebra mussels and then later decided to track all non-native aquatic species. Now. The database now is a very modern, you know, digital web application, but our charge really hasn't changed. We are a data repository and information management system for all non-native aquatic species. And we want to provide that out as timely, reliable data about the presence and distribution to all stakeholders. Here's our database uh, as it looks now, and you'll find a wealth of information um, on it, including scientific reports real-time queries that you could ask about our specimen data, spatial data, including what you see here, which is the distribution of zebra mussels in the uh, upper Mississippi, distribution maps, general information on our species profiles, and uh, a new application, an automated system called SANE, which stands for Screen and Evaluate Invasive and Non-Native Data, to allow you to upload any biological data set and have it search for non-Indigenous species in there, both exotic, and native transplants in um, places where they, they shouldn't be. Currently, we track just over 1,300 aquatic species from the contiguous U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, and island territories, and we're expanding north and south to include Canada and Mexico to think about movement of non-native species across political boundaries and those shared drainages. Currently, we track bryozoans, crustaceans, mollusks, other freshwater invertebrates, including jellyfish, amphibians, freshwater fish, marine fish, mammals, reptiles, and obligate aquatic plants. All this information drages all the way back to the 1800s, making us unique amongst many databases as we mine historical data to get the full picture of invasions. A lot of the data is coming from museums, other federal agencies, state agencies, academics, from the scientific literature, other databases, both natural history and invasive species focus, citizen science, of course, we have a portal right on our landing page that anybody can report to us a potential sighting. And what you see here on the uh, slide is a representation of a sighting report that our NES scientists will go through and verify both the species verification and the accuracy of the spatial location. Of course, we also get information from non-government organizations and coming soon, we're going to start integrating eDNA as a new source of information on potential invasive species. So what do we contribute to the USGS Biosurveillance Network? Well, the key to prevention is awareness. And so one of the aspects of the database is we're the central source of information on non-native aquatic species in the U.S. This includes the known impacts which I'll show you with our new impacts tables and thinking about what is the potential next invader when looking at horizon scans. And we'll talk a little bit about our national horizon scan that we're contributing to. We also developed multiple actionable tools that take the information within our database and provide it in a way that will make uh, decision-making easier. And I'll give the example of our flood and storm tracker or fast maps. We also aid in early detection. It's important with early detection to get the data in the right hands of the decision makers. And so we have a system to distribute new sightings through our alert emails that go out to our subscribers, and then our alert risk maps, which document the potential spread of a new sighting. We also have new sources of data that we're integrating within the database. As I said earlier, I'll talk a little about our eDNA efforts and then how we're integrating citizen science. So let's start with one of the, the newest introductions to the, the database, the impact tables. So as I said, awareness is a key to prevention. We need to know what we're looking for, what species to prioritize. The impact tables will kind of aid in that prioritization because the impact tables are a synthesis of all known impacts of select uh, groups of species. The tables can be found on our species profiles and uh, our, 
are composed of a comprehensive literature review of documents and scientific literature and anecdotal impacts. There are three broad categories that we're tracking for impacts, ecological, economic, and human health, with 16 different kind of subcategories within each, with three examples on this slide. You can take the ecological impacts to property value, to navigation, and then the, I'm sorry, those are economic, and then the ecological impacts with genetics. The categories are depicted by these interactive icons that we show here, which are summarized within a table. And then each of those tables has a link to sources of the NES reference database. The tables are dynamic and will be updated regularly with the current literature. And we see it becoming a real integral part of the NES database for years to come. This provides a stakeholder a single location to find all known impacts from non-native species. So for example, I have 11 or so here competition impacts from Dresdena mussels, this one being zebra mussel. And at any point you could come in, click that icon on the species profile, pull up this table, and then you can come over to our reference, click it, and get which particular reference that competition impact came from. I'm going to talk a little bit about a, a joint venture that USGS and Fish and Wildlife have taken on and that the NAS program is contributing to, which is a national horizon scan. So what is a horizon scan? It's a systematic examination of potential threats and opportunities. And so this project started in 2020, as I said, a joint project with Fish and Wildlife to conduct this national horizon scan to help identify alien vertebrate species within the organisms and trade pathway. So that'd be both the pet and live animal pathway that are imported into the U.S. that have the potential to be a risk to the country by becoming potentially established or becoming invasive. Our work is addressing the arrival, establishment, and impact via consideration of its popular pressure, climatic similarity to its occupied range, prior invasion history, focal species, and its relatives, and our approach is unique amongst horizon scans as we're reviewing tens of thousands of organisms in trade to identify species that have had high risk of becoming invasive in the U.S. And by starting with that large pool of species, there's a greater opportunity to recognize new species with no known invasion history. So we're very excited about this work and it should be completed in October of this year. So as I mentioned earlier, the NES database has been developing multiple actionable uh, tools to help inform uh, decision makers. One that I'd like to point out today is our flood and storm tracker map or FAST map. The FAST maps were created to help assess impacts of non-native aquatic species distributions due to flooding associated with storms, both being hurricanes or just a very large rainstorm. Uh, storm surge and flood events can assist the expansion and distribution of non-native aquatic species through connection with adjacent drainages, backflow upstream of impoundments, increased downstream flow, and the creation of freshwater bridges or freshwater lenses along the coastal uh, regions. These maps help natural resource managers determine potential new locations for individual species or to develop watch lists of potential new species within a drainage. Fast maps are created for every major flood in the U.S. since 2017, and the initial maps are created when one to two, three, two to three days of the event to quickly identify uh, flooded drainages based on USGS flood gauges and storm tide sensors with water heights above flood stage. So in this example here on this map, we can um, see this Hurricane Dorian, and um, there's two ways that you can withdraw information from the maps. First, you could pick an individual species from our selected species drop down menu on the left. And the examples here are in um, letter A. And you can see both here, you can look at the currently invaded ranges, or you can look at potential new invaded ranges in the dark green based on the flood connections. Or if you're interested in a single drainage, you could go with the option B and just select a, a drainage from the map. And you'll have this little pop up when you come up showing you list of species that are present in the uh, watershed already based on the NES database, and the ones that have the potential to spread to it based again on those flood models. So when we're thinking about early detection, one of the great tools that the NES data provides is our email alerts and our alert risk maps. Early detection rap response requires getting that pertinent information into the right hands of decision makers. And our alert system is tailored to provide natural resource managers the information they request to help them plan and manage 
the impacts of non-natives in their states, their parks, and conserved areas. With these email alerts, they're sent out for all new species sightings that occur either in the U.S., a new one to a state, a county, or to a drainage. And users can sign up on our website for these emails and customize them if you prefer just a specific state, a species, or a, a group of species. Currently, hey, we have 1,067 email subscribers that are, are receiving these emails every day. On the screen here are examples of our alert risk maps. These are uh, part of the alert emails that are sent out. They accompany them and provide information on short-term risk of invasions from a newly sighted species, with the purple areas being represented to map areas of at risk of invasion if the species did become established and would continue to move on and those were determined by the species mobility and drainage barriers. So looking towards the needs of our partners, the NES scientists in collaboration with environmental DNA or eDNA interagency experts have come up with a consensus method of community data standards for integrating eDNA into the NES database. We really see the combination of our traditional specimen sightings with eDNA provide us the most robust way of really looking for and identifying future invasions. There are three main goals of integrating the eDNA into the NES database. We want to establish and maintain a um, community data standard with the cutting edge of eDNA science. We want to develop a robust uh, communication network with all of our managers to inform them um, of these new eDNA sightings for, so they can make decisions that are responsive, but minimize unnecessary responses and provide a public interface to vet it with all this vetted eDNA data for anyone to utilize. Now, citizen science is also becoming a, a very important um, source of invasive species data. A large number of NES's um, alert-worthy specimens, ones that are sent out in those emails, are coming directly from citizen science reports. In 2020, arguably a uh, kind of slow year for sighting reports, we had 254 noteworthy alerts and 21% of those were coming directly from citizen reports. And so that's one, one aspect that we're really embracing is utilization of citizen science that is all verified through the USGS scientists so that it's high quality. And actually our next uh, speaker, our next guest was one of those. She reported the first uh, sighting of the zebra mussels on the aquarium moss balls. And I just wanna take uh, just a brief second here because I'm, I'm running short on time to just kind of give a, a general overview of that timeline with the, the zebra moss balls. The first sighting was reported to the USGS and verified by myself on March 2nd, and that came from Seattle, Washington. By the third, we had two states verified, Washington and Florida, and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and USDA had been alerted and the General Aquatic Nuisance Species Task Force. By the next day, by March 3rd, we had eight states verified with infested moss balls, and by the fourth, we had 17 states. Jumping ahead by March 12th, Canada had formed an independent incident command system response and had contacted the Aquatic Nuisance Species Task Force and coordinated info sharing. And at that point, 38 states had been identified as having infested moss balls. By the end of April, we're up to 46 states that have confirmed moss ball sightings. The important things about this is the continued efforts by both USDA and Fish and Wildlife. Uh, right now, they're um, trying to control the imports referring all moss ball shipments through JFK and LAX for LAX for inspection. And as John Amberg will discuss in a minute, they're uh, utilizing new eDNA techniques to uh, actually look for moss, uh, zebra mussels on these moss balls. So I just wanna conclude very quickly. I work with an incredible team. It's a pleasure every day to get to work with all these biologists. We're all biologists and wildlife ecologists. And we have a wealth of experience and knowledge and we're eager to work with anybody. So if you have questions or data needs, please do not hesitate to contact us. And I don't think I have any time for questions. Maybe, maybe I do. Thank you. Thanks, Wes. So this is Miss Maggie Brown. Maggie was the initial cider from Seattle that reported the, the moss balls with the zero mussels. Maggie's been a tremendous uh, help with that initial sighting because there was some verification that was needed since it was such a unique sighting report getting something and saying some, a, a zebra mussel is showing up in a pet store. So I'm, I'm very eager to introduce Maggie and thank her for all her efforts. <laughs> Hi, thank you. <laughs> thank you. 
Um, yes, yes. Thank you very much, Maggie. You, you created quite a stir and we really appreciate it. And I'd like to let you know that I'm going to be sending in the mail to you a, a, a letter that, that we developed a, across agencies in the federal government. And, and it is um, going to be on National Invasive Species Council letterhead and Stas Virgil, who is the executive director of the National Invasive Species Council, has signed off as have a, a few other of us who are very grateful for, for what you've done. So that will be coming to your house very soon. Cool, thank you. <laughs> yeah, and, and Maggie, I appreciate, I think it's a, a little bit early out on the West Coast, so thank you for, for joining us. I'm Stosh Virgil, I'm the Executive Director for the National Invasive Species Council. And as Cindy mentioned, for your contribution to the struggle against invasives, we wanted to, to recognize you today. And I'm going to paraphrase briefly from that letter. National Invasive Species Awareness Week provides the perfect opportunity to recognize and thank Ms. Brown and to showcase what one citizen can accomplish by being aware of invasive species and taking a small action to make a big difference. Literally, millions and millions of dollars have been invested in efforts to contain and control invasive mussels, including efforts by federal, state, tribal, and local governments. It's important to acknowledge Ms. Brown's awareness of the danger of spreading zebra mussels through contaminated moss falls, her follow through to report to the proper authorities, and her willingness to work with the NAS database program managers to verify the siting. These were the first steps in a larger movement to protect the waterways of the United States, as well as to protect those larger financial investments to prevent the introduction and spread of invasive mussels to new areas. Ms. Brown's actions set in motion a coordinated federal and state effort to prevent the further importation, distribution, and potential release of one of the nation's most harmful invasive species. At the federal level, this has included a coordinated frontline response from the Departments of the Interior, Agriculture, and Homeland Security, as well as additional involvement from the Departments of State, Commerce, and other agencies. At the state level, contaminated aquarium moss balls have been located in 46 states, which has widened the response even further. Looking forward, Ms. Brown's efforts have important ramifications that are informing a more robust prevention, detection, reporting, and response program for the United States. In summary, prevention and early detection efforts rely heavily on citizen scientists and private citizens like Maggie Brown. On behalf of the federal agencies involved in the nationwide response to aquarium moss balls contaminated with zebra mussels, we extend our profound appreciation to Maggie Brown for her excellence and stewardship. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stas. Thank you. Cindy, would you like to open up to maybe questions for Maggie? Uh, we have, yeah, we have, we have a few minutes yet. So are there any questions for Maggie? Yes, Cindy, this is Patrick. I'd, I'd like to ask a question. Go right ahead. Yeah, Maggie, I'm Patrick Kuchowski. I'm an invasive uh, species specialist with USGS. And I'm just curious, how did you know about the non-indigenous aquatic species database? Honestly, I googled how to report invasive zebra mussels and the database was the first result that popped up. That's excellent. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. How did you know, how did you know that they were zebra mussels? Did you have prior like education on invasive species or how did you know that you had an invasive species there? Yeah, I don't remember exactly where I learned about zebra mussels, but I did have prior knowledge about them. I think I probably saw them first in a class or a like a summer program or maybe on a blog. But as a biology student, I, I look at you know, I see a lot of things about invasive species. And they were pretty easy to recognize. Well, thank you so much. We are all very appreciative. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you heard the quiet um, round of applause you were getting from everyone at home. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Anything else for Maggie? Okay, I think I heard that there was a question for Wes that was in the, the Q&A. You know, you just saved me a whole bunch of typing because I was about to answer Jerry, you know, uh, through the, the, the text, but I will happily do it live. So the question is, how do you manage data quality from out sources? And, and that's a great question, Jerry. It, it really depends on the data source itself. There are a lot of uh, professional groups that work directly with invasive species, EdMaps, IMAPS invasive, their importation of their data is more checked to make sure we're not duplicating records and that the, uh, the we're using the same taxonomic identification and especially that it's accurate. When it comes from other probably less expertise groups like citizen science, 
we need photos or voucher specimens to verify the, the species. And then we, again, we check the spatial location because often um, you might get some error in your GPS readings related to where the locality description is. We do integrate data from uh, museums. Of course, that would be uh, nearly impossible to uh, verify all. So there's a lot of trust, but we do go back and check those also. We uh, pull them up, we look at the distribution. If something is uh, very skewed, very far outside of the known distribution of a certain species, we'll go back to the museum for verification and we have found errors. And so those are things that we report back to museums and they could go back, check and verify if there has been some kind of problem. So it's a lot of work on our end, but we take a lot of pride in having high quality data that's always ready for any use of uh, research or um, decision making. We are not the biggest database by far, but we stand behind every data record that we have within the NES database. Ah, good question. So we have an anonymous attendee saying, how do you deal with observation fatigue when a new species finally gets reported, but people start reporting new locations because everyone knows it. That is a very uh, astute observation and, and a problem because there are many species that I don't like using the term naturalized, but people just accept. Uh, a great com uh, a great example is common carp. Common carp are non-native, but have been here for nearly as long as, as uh, Western settlers have been here. And so it's one of those species that just doesn't get reported as much. What we do is try to remind people that that information is still pertinent, that we still want to know about the lionfish, even though we've been battling them for a long time, or zebra mussels. And usually the, the high-end impactful species continue to get reported, you know, the snakeheads, the pythons, you know, the zebra mussels as that example. It's the, usually the other ones, the ones that have less impacts, but maybe are, are less well known that uh, you kind of experience that uh, observation fatigue. And we just try to remind people that it, it's still important, but it, it is a real phenomenon. And you can see that within the timelines of our, our database. Thank you. Next, we're going to hear from John Amber from the Upper Midwest Environmental Sciences Center. Hello, everyone. I am John Amber. I am a supervisory biologist coming from La Crosse, Wisconsin. I lead a team of scientists that are doing work on rapid early detection and, and rapid response for aquatic invasive species. And I want to thank you for the opportunity to talk about the evolution of the point of use uh, DNA detector for early detection. I'm going to go ahead and turn off my, my screen or my uh, video so I could share the bandwidth so that I don't have any issues. I have some videos in this presentation. So there's been a lot of interest in using environmental DNA, which is really just simply DNA from an organism that's detected in things like water, soil, or even air. It's a really simple process. That's what makes it great. It just requires one to go out, collect a sample, concentrate the DNA within that sample, then extract the DNA, and then amplify it. And if you get an amplification, it generally would, would indicate that you detected that, that DNA. It often is used for, for invasive species like with the Asian carp throughout the, the Midwest. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is, is using it as a, as a tool for early detection. Much of the eDNA presently has, has been focused in on collecting samples and bringing them back into the lab and then analyzing them using qPCR, quantitative PCR, for just a, an individual species. They are now expanding it into looking at uh, a variety of different taxa within a sample. But generally speaking, one just targets a, a specific species and then analyzes the DNA and sees if that species DNA is actually present within that, within that sample. The, the whole approach generally is really quite time consuming and relies on an intensive amount of sampling, as well as bringing the samples back to the lab extracting the DNA, analyzing it, and then finally reporting it. So it's in, in terms of early detection, it's not, it, it's not immediate. It can take some days, if not weeks, before you get a positive detection. And resource managers have, have, have indicated that they highly desire some sort of system or approach that can be used to detect that DNA at that source. And one 
that's that's generally has a really rapid turnaround, something that's maybe less than an hour, something that could be used to screen various goods that are, are, are moving around the country or coming into the country or help direct further sampling. And then really something also that's really quite easy to use, something that you don't need to be putting a, a molecular biologist or a geneticist out in the field, and maybe you could put it into the hands of a, a technician that is, is field savvy, that can collect the water sample, process it, and move on. And this is where the, the LAMP comes into play. LAMP is, is loop-mediated isothermal amplification, and it's, it's simple to use and requires no cycling, so it's really efficient. qPCR, or, or polymerase chain reaction, requires a cycling of, of temperatures going up and down. This is at 65 degrees constant temperature for it to, to amplify which makes it much more efficient and lends itself for use in this, this type of approach. It's been used in the past for medical diagnostics. It was used to detect Ebola in the, in the outbreak several years ago, particularly in West Africa, where they were able to put it in the hands, these types of uh, systems in the hands of, of tribal leaders to screen potential patients for the presence of Ebola. And most recently, it was the test for, for detection of COVID. With the bait trade and invasive carp, a report came out several years ago that invasive carp DNA was detected in several bait shops throughout the upper Midwest. Some scientists went around and collected water samples from here in the United States. And, and really this approach lends itself well to being used as a point of source system for detecting DNA in environmental samples. An opportunity kind of presented itself from the bait shops. They detected some invasive species and some of those indicated that they had invasive carp DNA present. We wanted to see if we could actually use LAMP to detect a silver carp or big head carp in a shipment of, of bait minnows. These, the, the bait gets transported around the Midwest, it's collected in specific areas. And you can see from the picture here, trying to detect a single small invasive carp in that net full of, of minnows would be incredibly challenging. So we wanted to see if we could actually detect, use the DNA and use the LAMP assay for detecting an invasive carp in that bait. So we actually uh, tested it. We developed a, a LAMP assay for silver and big head carp. We used the assay to see if we could detect a single carp mixed in with 35,000 bait minnows, it, or do we actually need some more carp present? So we did have a, a treatment where we looked at putting 10 carp into the, the system as well. And then we also wanted to know whether or not you needed to be a geneticist or someone who has a significant amount of experience with molecular biology to get reliable results. So we had both some experts and novices collect the samples and analyze from a bait hauler. So here's a video uh, that shows how the sample is actually collected. This is a conservation officer from, I believe, Minnesota that is going to collect the sample. And he's grabbing a, a filter that he puts into a, a filter apparatus that you then will seal that up that is attached to a peristolic pump. They'll go to the bait hauler, attach the peristolic pump to a cordless drill, and then basically run a set amount of water through that filter. In this case, it was a half a liter of water. He opens up the filter or the filter apparatus removes the filter and will put it into a small 50 mil conical tube for further processing. And that is all it takes to collect the sample. And this video actually shows what you do once you have that, that filter. So she's taken apart the, the little kit. The, this is the strip that actually will run the assay on, on one of these machines in the background. She's taking the extraction buffer and runs it over the filter. And then she will, that, 
extraction buffer actually will lyse all the cells and release the DNA. She then will fill a tube with that DNA and that buffer, label it. Two of these wells, this is an eight tube, this, is, this strip is eight tubes. One of them is a control and one of them is your, one of them is a negative control, one's a positive control and she'll fill samples with, she'll fill vials with her sample. So then mix by hand, just tap it along, tap it against your hand or flick it and mix it and then put it on the machine and hit the, the run button. So it worked quite well. We were able to detect the single cart mixed in with all those minnows. It might have been a little bit better with if we had more carp, but we were able to detect it with a pretty high probability if we just had a single carp in there. Of course, the more time that you had the carp in the tank, the higher the probability of, of detecting it, the more likely it was that we, we got positive results. And since DNA is, is generally trying to find a needle in a haystack, you want to try to sample as much of that haystack as you can, so you can improve your probability by detecting for detecting a single fish earlier with a higher number of replicates. Since the strip is, allows us to, to do six replicates with our, our two controls, you know, if, the, if a single carp was, was present in the tank for two, a little over two hours, we, were, we had a, nine, a greater than 95% confidence in, in detecting it. If there was more carp in there, of course, it would be uh, much earlier. Than that. It also is quite simple to use. We really saw no differences between the novices and the experts, whether it was for the, the 10 carp tanks or the, the single carp system. This looks like there is different, statistically there is no difference between these two. So you don't need to be a, a geneticist or a molecular biologist to run this assay. And this is a short video that um, we put together for kind of an outreach to demonstrate the the simplicity of this system. So the girl that you see in the video right there with the pink shirt, so she was going to be a freshman in, in high school. In the beginning of the, the video, there's a, a young girl, she actually was in second grade. Both of them were able to successfully do the, the kit. I wouldn't advise putting it in the hands of a, a second grader. Their, their, their attention span is quite limited. So, but it's definitely easy to demonstrate how the ease of, of this system. We also developed an assay for detecting round goby in the field. We looked at three different sites that had known goby populations, one with a high population, one with a medium, and then one with a low, and then four unknowns. And then we had the negative control site that had no gobies. And we compared the LAMP assay to uh, qPCR, which is kind of the gold standard. The purpose of this study was one to, to see if we could detect gobies in some of the, the unknown sites, but also to demonstrate that you're able to use the lamp with uh, water that would likely have high inhibition to demonstrate that we still would be able to, to detect the species of, of interest. <clears throat> we did, ended up detecting gobies at all of the sites. The highest, the, the site that had the highest population gave us the, the highest probability of detection, the lowest with the lowest probability. We got no detections at the negative site or any of the unknown sites. And we got similar results between the LAMP and, and qPCR. However, the, the LAMP is a little less sensitive than, than qPCR. So qPCR is by far, is, is much more sensitive than, than the, the LAMP. But keeping that in mind with the qPCR, you're bringing that, that sample back into the lab and running it, whereas the, the lamp, you're actually able to run that in the boat if you wanted to, so it makes it much more useful. And with this study, we were able to demonstrate that we could detect the, the targeted organism in water samples collected from, from streams or lakes that likely had not perfect water like you would anticipate in a, a bait hauler, something that had, had inhibition and it worked 
very well. So now we know that we could detect a single organism in a shipment, and we know that the assay will work quite well with water that isn't, isn't quite perfect. So this is where the kind of the, the moss balls come into play. All of this has made it attractive as a tool to help screen imports. And recently the dracidid mussels have been found in the shipments of moss balls. These moss balls are imported generally for aquariums, water gardens, and terrariums, et cetera. Upon the discovery, it pretty much stopped the, the imports are coming in through just a couple of ports now. And all of the systems that contained them had to be de decontaminated. The Fish and Wildlife Service saw this as an opportunity to, to use the, the point of use kit. And we already had a lamp assay that was developed for moss balls or for dracidid mussels. We just needed to adapt it for screening of moss balls. To use our assay, we had to initiate studies that met the requirements to validate the method for forensics, which is a much higher bar than a lot of, than just a, a standard eDNA test. Many of these studies can be done generally pretty easily, but when we think about the specificity, it's a lot different than the specificity that we do just typically for, for eDNA. So we already had the specificity done for dracinid mussels in throughout the, the Great Lakes region in the upper mist. However, we did not have the specificity done for, for detecting dracinid mussels and moss balls because we need to have the specificity. We had to demonstrate it for uh, species that are present in the source water, meaning we needed to get water from from the Ukraine. So we're working with the Fish and Wildlife Service to obtain samples from, from the source waters. And then we're working with the Fish and Wildlife Service Wildlife Forensics Lab in Oregon to complete all of these studies to the level that is needed for, for legal actions. To kind of summarize things and wrap things up here, you know, the evolution of the, the point of use kit, we were able to so we kept hearing that resource managers generally desire something that's field deployable, which is exactly what the lamp has been used for as a, a, in terms of a medical tool. So we developed a system for invasive carps and round gobies. We developed it to work to detect both of those. And one also didn't need to be a geneticist or a, a molecular biologist to actually use it and get reliable results. We have now been asked to develop and validate the assay for use to detect uh, dracidid mussels in moss ball shipments and we're currently working with the, the forensics group out of oregon to complete this and so hopefully within the next couple of, within the next month or so we'll be able to to report on the status of it as a tool for screening customs with that i will be more than happy to answer any questions that you might have I think there are questions in the Q&A. So first question, how does cost of analysis between a LAMP and QPCR compare? The LAMP enzyme is uh, considerably more expensive. However, the price is starting to go down. LAMP was, was under patent and about a year ago, it started to come off of the, the various patents and which has made it much more affordable. Previously, it was, you know, there was only a handful, there was not, I don't think it was a handful, it was about two sources of, that we were able to get it in the United States. So it made it much more expensive, but it is getting cheaper. QPCR by far is, is much cheaper, but it's also, if you start to put in people's time, it probably would be comparable. So second question, do you ever see eDNA as a tool for terrestrial invasive species? I do. I think Carter Atkinson from Pierce in Hawaii has developed a system to be able to detect, to collect a bunch of DNA from air. And we've done some work with him for, for to analyze fungal spores and stuff. The, and I think that you, it, it would be useful in, for detecting terrestrial invasives. Another question, how do you manage uh, contamination or cross-contamination via multiple, multiple collections? Each one of, so each one of those little kits that you, that you saw in the video, those are all separate and disposable. So everything is thrown out 
between each sample except for the the pump and the filter apparatus. Those you would run through a you'd actually filter or run a, a bleach solution through those to keep them clean and then rinse them with with the eye water. But everything is to minimize it with the pipettes and stuff like that, it's everything is all disposable. So another question is once an assay is developed, what is the cost of all the equipment that is needed? That little the reader is, which is like a, we'll call it about the size of a toaster that runs about nine to ten thousand dollars. But you, that you, once you have that, you you have it. And then the the strips right now they're running at about a hundred dollars uh, a test strip. But that price is is going down. And the more, of course, the more demand, the the cheaper it'll they, they become. So I can't really tell you how much for the for the test strips because if, if, again if we get more requests for them they would they would the price would go down but in terms of of all of the other types of equipment that would be required the pump the drill the the filter apparatus and whatnot that's you under ten thousand dollars another question do you have lamp assays for both zebra mussels and gobies published yet they are not i do not believe that either of those two are published yet gobies that that is a publication in the works right now a scientist chris Merkes, that works for me he is he is pulling that together right now and then zebra mussels once we get the assay that was one that we just done on the side and had and once we get through the validation for the, the forensics, we'll publish that immediately. So Steve Spear, one of my geneticists, is, is wrapping that up right now, pulling all that together. Another question, how does the technology compare to handheld qPCR machines that can produce fast results in the field? It would be something similar. The, the benefit of, of LAMP is that it's, it, it, it's doesn't take a whole lot of energy. So the machines are deployable. The other thing that I'm not too familiar with the, the handheld QPCR machines, but there has been talk about being able to upload the data from these machines through satellites to, to labs and stuff like that. So and with, Q, with, with the lamp, you do get an amplification curve much like the, the QPCR. So there's lots of questions. <laughs> How does LAMP perform in flowing waters? Pretty much the same as QPCR. I, I anticipate seeing the, the, the same thing. Some of the streams that we collected for Gobi were, were running water, so uh, it worked quite well. Can this be implemented in crime scene forensics? Potentially, I, I could see it. What about hybrid fishes? That's part of the accuracy that we need to, to demonstrate as part of the forensics. John, let's I, I'm gonna, I'll answer it. <laughs> I'll type the answers. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Appreciate it. I, and we're going to move to, I'm going to introduce Patrick Tchaikovsky, and he is an invasive species specialist with the BioThreads program at USGS. And uh, Patrick manages our invasive carp research portfolio, and he's going to moderate a few talks here. So Patrick. Thanks, Cindy. Uh, Cindy mentioned I'm a newly minted invasive species specialist for the ecosystem mission area. I came to this job after having helped build a grass carp research program in the Great Lakes. And for this next portion, we're going to focus on the program I helped to oversee, which focuses mostly on invasive carps, but we're also going to continue the theme of early detection. Uh, our first speaker will talk about how eDNA is being used as an early detection method and how that will be incorporated into gauging stations, the very large USGS gauging network that's available on rivers throughout the country. After that, uh, Ryan Jackson will follow up with development of mathematical models that have been used to track the fate of invasive carp eggs in rivers and how the, that can be employed not only to track eggs, but also as an early detection tool. Next up will be uh, Dwayne Chapman and his colleague Jesse Fisher, who have developed a specialized method of capturing large numbers of invasive carp in a fairly short period of time. And his presentation will focus on a recent effort in the upper Mississippi River, where they not only captured large numbers of fish, but also demonstrated its utility 
as an early detection tool. Our last speaker in this session will be Jim Dunker, who will talk about real-time acoustic telemetry and how it's used as early detection and how that leads into management. So with that, I'll turn it over to our research scientist, Adam Sepulveda at our Northern Rockies uh, Research Station. Adam, the floor is yours. Thank you. All right, perfect, thank you. Well, thank you for uh, inviting me to present. Today I'll be uh, talking about some of the work we've been doing with Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, MBARI, to explore the utility of robotic eDNA surveillance at USGS stream gauges. I want to acknowledge my co-author, Elliot Barnhart, who's with the USGS here in Montana, but with the Water Science Center. So this is an example of a collaboration between USGS ecosystem centers and USGS water science centers, who, for the most part, run and operate and maintain all the stream gauges across the country, amongst other things. So John did a great setup for me. He, you know, identified the importance of early detection and how that really is one of the primary pillars in our uh, effort to, I guess, control, minimize the impacts of invasive species across the country, regardless of that's aquatic or terrestrial. So the, the, John, I said, teed me up perfectly talking about the importance of early detection and how that's a pillar of, of our strategy for minimizing and controlling the impacts of invasive species. But in general, again, as John alluded to, we have traditionally lacked very or effective detection tools. More recently, in the last 10 years, Environmental DNA, eDNA has come on board. And as John said a couple of times, you know, this is a great molecular tool that helps us find the needle in the haystack using molecular methods. But also, as he mentioned, to be very effective, it takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of samples. It, talks, it takes a lot of replicates. And arguably, it also takes being at the right place at the right time. So at some point, even with environmental DNA methods, we hit a bottleneck of not having enough funding to get all the samples we need or not having enough personnel or machines to go out there and do all the tests we need to do at high enough effort. So that's currently kind of the bottleneck in this environmental DNA system is we can't be at the right place at the right time to do biosurveillance everywhere we need to be doing. And so the future potentially is merging environmental DNA tools with robots and the stream gauge network. Environmental DNA, as we've talked about, is a very sensitive molecular tool for detecting the DNA of rare species. John suggested one, one uh, carp amongst 35,000 minnows, and that's a great example of its sensitivity. Robots are a great autonomous tool that we can employ and program to collect environmental D DNA samples. And the USGS operates an intensive stream gauge network with over 8,000 gauges across the country. And importantly, these stream gauges are at partner relevant sites. So sites that our state agency and or DOI partners have already identified as being uh, critical to their infrastructure, whether that's for uh, water delivery and irrigation, or if it's for identifying flood risk to municipalities. So uh, very important areas. In addition, the US stream, stream gauge network collects abiotic, abiotic data, such as a, a river flow, water temperature, and sometimes other water chemistry parameters at very high intervals. And so by collecting environmental DNA samples, which tell us about the biology, we're able to put that in the context of the physical environment. And so potentially merge environmental DNA with robots and stream gauges, we can see how these can become a force multiplier to allow us to hopefully do a lot more. And so the future, just kind of showing in that graphic, is the idea of having a stream gauge house that uh, automates the collection of environment or environmental DNA samples. At some point in the future, it's able to process those on site. Maybe that's with John's lamp, uh, lamp tools, or maybe that's with a more qPCR or other, other format. It's then able to blast that signal to a satellite, and then gets uh, maybe it then goes to the USGS NAS database, and you get your alert on your phone letting you know of a potential invasive species. So that's the hope for the future. But how close, so today I'm gonna to give an update on where we are with robotic eDNA samplers, talk about a couple of examples of uh, how we've deployed them at US stream, gauge, stream gauges, we'll discuss what we learned, and then finally get to the most important point, are they cost? So let me first talk a little bit about the robot that we're using. There, there are a handful of robots out there that are likely capable of doing this technology. We have uh, been working with Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute in Bari to explore the use of a technology they've been pioneering for 25 years, 
It's called the Environmental Sample Processor. It's shown here in the photo. Just to put that, I guess, the dimensions in perspective, that robot, that kind of cylindrical robot is uh, approximately three and a half feet high and weighs a couple of hundred pounds. And Bari, the Monterey Bay Group, have been developing this technology to, to be used in the deep ocean over the last 25 years. I won't go into too much detail. I think the important thing here is that they have really worked out all of its kinks. It's an autonomous robot, which means that once you set up a mission, it can do all the work on its own. There's two-way communication, so you can change the programming on the fly from your computer or or cell phone to communicate with it. And it can also communicate with you telling you when it's sampled or when it's broken. With this a robot that I show here, it has 130 sample payload. So you're able to collect 130 samples per mission. A mission could be anything from a few weeks to potentially a year or longer. And there is in situ on-site analysis potential. And Bari has demonstrated that you can do connect kind of a, a quantitative PCR module to actually do the analyses on site. So a lot of potential here. How it works, so, and I'll, I'll kind of explain briefly how it worked for us and how we, we are using it. Everyone has very different uses, but how we uh, use it, we set up a, a sampling mission program for those 130 samples. For example, we can program the robot to collect a, a sample every four hours, or we can connect it with a temperature module and say, whenever the water temperature hits 12 degrees C, collect a sample. So there's a lot of flexibility. The, the robot has a pump that pulls water into the robot, the environmental sample processor. It pushes it through this uh, kind of gold puck that's pictured here in the picture. Inside that gold puck is a filter. It's a 25 millimeter wide filter. The filters you were likely seeing in John's slideshow were probably more like uh, 45 to 47 millimeters wide. So this is a smaller filter. So water is pushed through that filter. A robotic arm then grabs that, that puck, that, that gold puck or copper puck, moves it over and squirts a preservative called RNA later on it, and then moves that puck over again into an area of, of samples uh, that have already been collected. The machine or the robot's then able to rinse all the tubing with the equivalent of bleach and water to sterilize it before the next sampling, sampling event takes place. As I said earlier, you can either do on-site analyses or as we do, you can retrieve all of the filters at the end of the mission and then take them back to the lab for PCR analysis. We've worked with Ambari to explore the potential of these robots across a range of species from fish parasites to human pathogens, from sites in California to, to national park sites where I'm located in, in the Montana region. So we've explored it across a bunch of different ecosystems. Today, I'm gonna to talk about a couple of the benefits that we've identified in these, in these evaluations. One, I'll talk about its potential for biosurveillance of upstream waters with an example from a, a reservoir just downstream of Grand Teton National Park in Wyoming. Talk about its potential for early detection in the Yellowstone River close to me here in Montana. And then talk about what these results may mean for making more confident inferences about species or DNA presence or DNA absence. Again, I'll, I'll refer to an example here in the Yellowstone. Uh, so first, biosurveillance of upstream waters. We did this project on Palisades Reservoir, which is about uh, 50 miles downstream of Jackson, Wyoming, uh, near Grand Teton National Park. There is a Bureau of Reclamation uh, dam on, on this reservoir. It's very important for hydropower for water delivery for downstream irrigation. We installed the robot into the stream gauge, which is roughly two kilometers downstream of the reservoir. And we wanted to ask the question is, can we use a robot to collect eDNA water samples to make inferences about what is happening in the reservoir upstream? We were funded to look for invasive dracena mussels, since this is a reservoir at the headwaters of the Columbia. We knew mussels were not likely to be present, and so we used a surrogate species, kokanee salmon, to kind of get a sense of its sensitivity for what's happening in the reservoir upstream. Kokanee are at very low abundance in that reservoir, so low that they don't show up in creel surveys by state agencies, and there are reservoir obligates here, so we know they're not uh, occurring in the river where the stream gauge is. So it's a pretty good surrogate to make inferences about what are the ability of the robot to, to do surveillance in the upstream reservoir. Here is a, uh, an example of our results with date on the x-axis and detection with the one, no detection with the zero on the y-axis. 
And what you'll see is we have a, a, you know, 130 samples of which about 30 are detections. So about 30 ones there across the board showing that yes, these, uh, this robot can make inferences about species presence in the upstream reservoir. And importantly, for any, any people that know Kokanee, they, tend to, they are fall spawners. And we are seeing kind of more detections at a time when we expect more biological activity. So as we're entering the end of, Sept or end of September, we start picking up our detections, which is what we'd expect with Kokanee probably being a bit more active in the reservoir as they're moving towards tributaries to, to spawn. So this was a, a very, I guess, positive confidence building result to, to, to indicate that these robots do have potential at the stream gauges for surveillance of upstream reservoirs. Next, I'll talk about early detection at a, at a, on a river, at the Yellowstone River. It's a big river here in August. And it, when we did this experiment, it's about 5,000 cubic feet uh, per second or about 140 cubic meters per second flowing. So that's a, a sizable river. What we did was we introduced canned mackerel because we're not really, it's not really ethical to introduce an invasive species or a new species to the system. So we played around and we put in some frozen mackerel that we blended up into kind of a bait ball, released that a few hundred meters upstream of the stream gauge where we had a robot and asked the question, could it detect the DNA of this mackerel? How soon? And it did it take a, a day to detect it or, or a week? We did this at two stream gauges on the Yellowstone River. And here on the x-axis, we have date with August 26 being when we threw in our macro bait ball. And on the y-axis is time of day. And then the two different symbols indicate our two different stream gauges where we had robots. And we got detections at both robots with one robot at the Corwin Spring stream gauge, which is just outside Yellowstone National Park. Picked it up three days after introducing the bait ball. And the other gauge, which is closer to Livingston, Montana, uh, a bit further downstream, picked it up about seven days later. So again, just indicative that even in these large rivers with lots of water, lots of dilution potential, these robots could sample at high enough frequency to pick up uh, a novel invader at very low abundance. Finally, I think one of the things that these robots do give us is a lot more confidence in what a negative result means. We've been trying to understand the distribution and abundance of a fish parasite that's causing fish deaths in the Yellowstone River. We collect manual weekly environmental DNA samples. So that means I'm going out grabbing water samples versus a robot. And the results of that at four different sites is shown in the upper right graph that's multicolored. And the important thing here is to, to bring your eye to is all the gray. Gray is indicating times when we have zero detections despite taking about 10 samples at a site at a given date. There's a lot of gray in that map. And so we, we were wondering, are we just missing it? Are we sampling at the wrong time of day? Are we, you know, should we be sampling on a Thursday and not a Tuesday? Is there something episodic with this parasite? And so we use the robot to collect samples every four hours for a two week period to try to understand if we were just missing it. The robot data are shown at the bottom of the figure. And indeed we had very few detections. We have lots of zeros and only uh, two detections at one gauge and three detections at the other gauge. So, you know, this is, uh, I guess, kind of reinforcing the idea that this truly is a very uh, rare signal. And even when we sample at a much higher effort, we get a lot of negatives. So it's just reinforcing the idea of what a negative result means versus us kind of wondering if, if we have a bunch of false negatives out there. We see that again, if we put it into statistical inference, here, confidence interval width is on the y-axis. The, the bigger your confidence interval width, the more uncertain you are with your estimates. And so we can do some comparisons with the robot, robot samples and say, you know, what if we just took one sample a month, uh, one sample a week, two samples a week, three samples a week, one sample a day, or two samples a day? How does our confidence in our estimate, our precision, how does that change? And what we see here is if we can take daily samples one time a day or two times a day, our confidence interval shrinks dramatically compared to monthly or weekly samples. So again, the more samples you take, which is what a robot allows you to do, the more confidence you have in, in, in making estimates about probability of occurrence or our probability of absence. So additional benefits of the robot, lots of cost savings. If we're gonna be paying hydro technicians or people to go out to collect samples, 
It's a lot of travel time, that's prep time, and that comes to out, out to be about four to $600 per sampling event. And the robot also offers us a lot of flexibility and adaptability. We can match sampling to our target species phenology, such as that kokanee example, where they tend to be more active in the fall, or if something that's maybe nocturnal, we can program it to collect more samples at night. We can also program it to collect uh, samples during rare or dangerous events like floods, or if, you know, given all the personnel travel issues with COVID, you know, during times when it's harder for us to get, to get out in the field. So there's a lot of flexibility that these robots do allow. Hoping to leave time for questions. So I will, I will end there. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. And I do see a couple of questions in the Q&A. Is there any work to identify hydrological factors, flow rate, sediment, et cetera, that increase or decrease sensitivity? There has been some work. Uh, we published a paper a few months ago where we took uh, these eDNA data that were collected from the robots at the Yellowstone and Snake Rivers, merged that with data that were collected by, that were available in the National Water Quality Portal, describing things like flow, water temperature and merge that again with data collected by NOAA weather sat stations that collect things like obviously air temperature, wind, precipitation to kind of understand how that influences your sensitivity. We didn't look at sediment per se. And so depending on, there's a lot of, it depends here with it, to answer that question. But yes, there, I guess I'll answer by saying there is a lot of reason to try to figure out how to take advantage of the abiotic data to better understand the biological patterns that eDNA provide, or that a lot of high frequency samples provide to give you the, the biology. It's gonna depend for everything, but I think, yeah, there, there, there's reason to, to go in that direction because we know that abiotic does uh, impair the sensitivity of our signal by creating a lot of noise. The next question, do some species or groups of species shed more eDNA than others? Without a doubt, I think it's not only species specific, it's also size of the species, maturity stage of the species. There's a lot of different factors that go into eDNA production, but I'll give you one example. As we're trying to use eDNA to understand fish outbreaks with this parasite, Tetracapsuloides bryosalmanae, the primary host is a bryozoan. We're trying to use eDNA to track the distribution um, and abundance of that bryozoan we're having the hardest time because it looks like bryozoans produce very little eDNA. You pretty much have to be sampling right on top of the bryozoan to get an eDNA signal. And that's in comparison to, you know, something like the kokanee salmon. You know, we are multiple kilometers downstream of them, yet we are able to get their eDNA because they are likely shedding it off at a much higher rate, especially when they are entering kind of that spawning period when there's probably a lot more pheromones and movement going on. Hey, thanks very much, Adam. That clears yep. the question block and that uh, takes us into our next talk by Ryan Jackson on the FluEgg model. Thanks, Patrick. <clears throat> so my name is Ryan Jackson. I'm a hydrologist with the USGS Central Midwest Water Science Center. So I come at this from a different standpoint with a specialty in, in river mixing and, and transport. What I want to talk about today is, is drift modeling as a bio threat surveillance tool. And I want to tell it through the Lake Erie grass carp story I, I, because it, it was a lot of our drift modeling work was heavily influenced by the, the Lake Erie grass carp and the evolution of that over the past decade or so. So stop video there. So first of all, I guess, you know, for the folks that, that may not know, what is drift modeling? And it's essentially a modeling of the transport and development of biological particles subject to currents in rivers, lakes, and the ocean. So you can have drift modeling in, in a lot of different surface water bodies. But essentially what you're trying to do is, is model the dispersal of, of eggs, larvae, any biological particle essentially within a river and capture the complexity of, of what's happening to those particles in the river as they develop and as they move downstream and disperse with, with the current. You can see this, this video hopefully that's showing up in the bottom left showing dye dispersing in a river. We can see the, the, the dye patch getting getting distorted in, in space as, as shear dispersion kind of takes over and, and that plume is subject to the velocity distribution of the river. And so we have to 
what what we're what our goal is with drift modeling is to do the same thing and, and model that those processes for for example for invasive carp you know where you had spawning at one location and as time evolves that plume moves downstream and and disperses so you know you can see these particles on on the right here essentially showing what amounts to about six different uh, locations in a simple flume test of our model of our drift model as that initial egg distribution gets, gets uh, dispersed downstream. So you're combining the biology and the development of those eggs along with the hydrodynamics or the physics uh, of the, the river system. And so it, you're, you're trying to, to capture pretty complex processes, both biologically and physically within these models. So how is it that drift modeling, drift modeling is a bi biological threat surveillance tool? Well, you have to understand the, the early life history of invasive carp. Invasive carp require rivers to spawn. They move up the rivers during higher flow events. They broadcast spawn their eggs within the water column and those eggs have to drift downstream and remain suspended until hatching. And then the, the larvae will continue to drift downstream in, until what's called the gas bladder inflation stage at which they, they begin lateral swimming or horizontal swimming and they can seek out nursery habitat. And so this, this whole process from spawning to gas bladder inflation depending on temperature, it can take up to, to, to a week to occur. And so you have a lot of potential drift within that model that, that you have to, or within that system that you have to account for with your model. And so back, you know, starting in 2007 with, with Kolar et al, where they, they looked at Great Lakes tributaries and said, okay, well, if invasive carp get in the Great Lakes, where are they going to spawn? They used a, a pretty simple criteria and said, well, you know, rivers in Asia suggest that we need about 100 kilometers of free-flowing river. And so they did a GIS analysis of the, the Great Lakes Basin, came up with, I think, 22 different rivers that met that criteria. At the time, there was another criteria of about 70 centimeters per second or, or 0.7 meters per second velocity, mean velocity in the flow, to keep those eggs in suspension. And so with, with dr this drift modeling that, that we started about the same time, we said, well, let's, let's see if we can do a little bit better if we capture the physics of the flow, rather than just saying, using the criteria of where they're, they're, the characteristics of the rivers in which they're spawning in Asia. And so we wanted to be able to predict egg and larval transport and dispersal to identify suitable spawning uh, rivers, inform sampling, monitoring efforts, so where to sample in a river and when, identify the most probable spawning locations, and identify events with the highest potential for recruitment. So those, what are the water quality and, and discharge characteristics in a river that, that lead to highest recruitment or potential for recruitment. And so effectively, you can see that these, especially the top three, guide early detection efforts, where and when to sample. And, you know, that was addressed in, in the previous talks, where to put those robotic samplers, what rivers to, to, to deploy your technology because we can't obviously instrument every river for, for early detection. So how do you concentrate your resources? And I think that's where really the fluvial a drift model comes into play. And so what we developed is a, a, a drift model. It's a fluvial egg and drift model that we call, it's developed specifically for invasive carp, but it's generally applicable in that we can model other eggs and, and larvae if we, if we know their growth functions or we can assume that they're constant density particles. It was initially developed as a tool to determine if Great Lakes tributaries are suitable for invasive carp spawning. So it was more of a risk assessment tool when it was originally developed. And this was developed by Tatiana Garcia, who was then a, a PhD candidate at University of Illinois in collaboration with USGS, both the Illinois Water Science Center at the time, uh, which I'm a part of, and the Columbia Environmental Research Center with, with Dwayne Chapman. And so effectively, FLUA takes this, this pretty complex river and breaks it down into a series of cells and models everything from the turbulence that drives the, the suspension of the eggs through this three-dimensional flow field to the movement and infection of those eggs through a random walk uh, process all the way through, through the growth of the eggs and hatching and, and then all the way to the gas bladder inflation stage. Back in, in 2013, we released Fluag. This So this was about 10 years, or sorry, three years after kind of the initiation of, of the project to identify Great Lakes tributaries that, that meet the invasive carp spawning criteria. And the first case study for Fluag was the Sandusky River in Ohio. And that was a, a case study kind of tacked onto the end of this, this paper where we introduced Fluag. 
And the reason for that case study was it very recently, so within the last year before that publication came out, Kikovsky et al., so Patrick, published a paper along with, with Dwayne Chapman and, and others that looked at Western ba Basin of Lake Erie and tributaries to, to that, that, that basin and tried to identify using the, the length criteria of 100 kilometers of free-flowing river velocity of, of 70 centimeters per second and they added predictions of summer water temperature, essentially about 21 C, to identify if which, which rivers in, in the Western Basin could support invasive carp spawning. And they found the Sandusky River was, was suitable, provided that, that Ballville Dam, which is about 25 kilometers upstream of the mouth, was removed. And, and Ballville Dam at the time was scheduled for removal, so they, they added it to the list. And then, and then Murphy and Jackson, we came along while we were developing FLUEG, we also had crews in the field doing field sampling for us during high flow events on key tributaries of the Great Lakes that we suspected might be spawning tributaries. And they collected, they basically floated downstream with, with these high flow events, similar to what eggs would do, and, and measured velocity, water quality parameters, and so on. And we took that and did a drift analysis a pre fluid drift analysis and found that with dam, Ballville Dam in place, that spawning from spawning to hatching, so that drift period could occur in less than 25 kilometers and eggs could remain in suspension as low as 15 centimeters per second. So when you look at the rules of thumb that were used previously, this is a quarter of the length and, and uh, a, a fraction of the velocity that's required. And so this was, was pretty big at the time, and it was a big statement to make, and, and it was a little bit concerning, obviously, because it, it'll open this up to a larger number of rivers within the, the Great Lakes. And so we, we immediately wanted to apply FLUEG to that, and, and FLUEG, with the modeling we did of the Lower Sandusky, it upheld those previous findings and supported that and said, despite those low velocities and the short reach, it is possible to have invasive carp spawning in the Lower Sandusky River with Ballville Dam in place. And so as, as this story evolved within later that year, so October of that year, everything switched essentially from risk assessment to rapid response in a sense, with the discovery of four adult grass carp that were most likely spawned within the Sandusky River based on otolith analysis and strontium calcium ratios. And they were likely spawned in 2011. And so this was the first evidence of grass carp recruitment in the Great Lakes Basin. It kind of shifted things towards, you know, from asking the question, you know, can you build us a tool that can help us identify which tributaries can support spawning to, can you use fluid to determine when and where grass carp spawn in the Sandusky River? And so right in the middle of all this, we dropped the release of Fluig and it was developed for risk analysis and immediately applied to guide Lake Erie grass carp response efforts. That's something that it wasn't necessarily designed for, so we had to be on the ball. And, and <clears throat> within two years, Holly, just to, to kind of put even more pressure on, on, on us with Fluig, Holly, uh, a UT graduate student, collected eight fertilized grass carp eggs in the Sandusky River, being the first confirmation of invasive carp spawning in the Great Lakes Basin. So we know they're recruiting, we know they're spawning in the Sandusky, and <clears throat> this was a direct response to that evidence in 2013 of those four grass carp. They went out and they started their early detection and sampling efforts. They found confirmation, and next on Holly's list for her thesis was to identify the spawning and hatching locations in the Sandusky River. And so Holly turned to Flue to help solve that problem. And <clears throat> So this was a new challenge for Fluig. It was this inverse source problem where we want to take Holly's grass carp eggs that were collected further down in the, the Sandusky River, utilize their little bio data loggers essentially where we know that we can, we can back calculate their, their age based on an assumption of water temperature or measurement of water temperature because it's, it's a function of the development is a function of water temperature and time and then back calculate when they were spawned and then use Fluig to help identify and predict where, the, where they were spawned upstream based on the hydraulics of the river and, and the modeling of Fluig. 
And so <clears throat> this became a, a new avenue of research with, with FluEgg to identify these spawning locations. And Holly utilized FluEgg in its, in its existing state and essentially did an iterative method where she proposed a spawning location, computed the plume downstream using FluEgg, determined if it was at the capture location, if eggs were at the capture location at the, the capture time, and continued many, many iterations through that process to build essentially a probability distribution of spawning locations for those eight eggs. And so at the same time Holly's doing this, we recognize the need to be able to do this within FluEgg and not necessarily have to employ this, this iterative method that, that is a lot of computational effort. And so we employed or developed the reverse particle tracking algorithm within FluEgg that essentially runs the model backwards from the spawning location or from the capture location, reverses the velocities, reverses the, the egg growth rates and so on, and, and back calculates where the spawning location is. Now this is, it's a single simulation is required, but dispersion is not reversible. So it doesn't predict a point upstream, it predicts an, a probability distribution similar to Holly's method with, with the, the Monte Carlo method. And so these are two predictions that you can kind of see in the bottom left using both techniques yield similar results without the need for iteration. So kind of coming back full circle to this grass carp in, in the Sandusky, Holly was able to identify the spawning area, most probable spawning area below Ballville Dam here, about three kilometers. And that was later confirmed by Patrick and his group in 2018. They were able to go back to that spawning area in 2018 and capture early life stage fertilized eggs as well as adult grass carp within a kilometer of that spawn, model predicted spawning area. And so it was, it was great confirmation. It validated the, the spawning location and allowed targeted removal by strike teams. And so this was all well and good. However, shortly after the publication of these results, or after, after the 2018 event, so later that year in September, uh, Ballville Dam was, was finally removed and it gave access to grass carp throughout the Sandusky River. So the story continues. It's, it's kind of like a bad series of movies. You know, I think, you know, this is like Fast and Furious, Furious 7 here where we have to now move upriver and, and repeat the analysis. So the future of FluEgg essentially right now is integration into multidimensional models. FluEgg has been integrated into the Environmental Fluid Dynamics Code model, uh, which was developed by the EPA and applied to, to Great Lakes tributaries, including the Sandusky for, for analysis. This is in collaboration with University of Toronto. And we're currently working with the Tennessee Valley Authority, Deltaris in the Netherlands to integrate FluEgg into the particle um, tracking module, module within DELF3D, which is another 3D uh, model. So the, the future is looking good for, for FluEgg. It's a very useful tool and, and it's, it's applicable well beyond invasive carp. So that I'll, I'll take any questions if there's time. Great, thank you, Ryan. And we do have one question in the Q&A box. Have you combined the drift models with eDNA e detections? We have not. So that's a, that's a great uh, a great idea and something that we've we've considered. You know, the the difficulty with with these drift models is is validation. You know, it's it's hard to get permission to go out and release uh, a lot of particles into a to a river and and track them similar to a dye study. So we, we have validated with dye studies. Uh, validating with with eDNA detections is is another opportunity, definitely. And yeah, so that would be interesting to follow up on that. Thank you, Ryan. And uh, Maggie, there's another answer being typed in by Dwayne Chapman. So please check on that. And if there are no further questions for Ryan, we'll move on to our next speaker. Dwayne Chapman and Jesse Fisher will now present to you on their method of capturing large numbers of invasive carp and how it can be used in early detection. Dwayne and Jesse, the floor is yours. Okay, so the I think I want to put the bottom line up front here in this talk. We recently trialed the modified unified method up in Pool 8 for the first time in, a, in an area of where the fish are. You're on the edge of the, of the invasion range, 
and low density. And in five days up there, we captured a number of silver carp that's equivalent to two thirds of the total previous full eight catch. All years, state, federal, commercial, and recreational fishers combined. The total number detected, because we can see them a lot sometimes and not catch them during this process, it makes the fish visible, was more than twice the number that we captured. And we did detect the fish at four of the five sites, which was kind of scary because we didn't expect that abundance or range of the fish. And uh, state collaborators are gearing up to use the method more broadly, state and federal collaborators, this coming fall. So um, this is one that's uh, probably going to go forward. The picture you're looking at is the first mod well, not, it's really more of a unified method that, that didn't contain many of the techniques that uh, we have been working into this thing. And, uh, but this is one that Kevin Irons and I did that uh, really led by the Illinois Department of Natural Resources, though, unified in Morris, Illinois. And we got 90,000 pounds of fish in an area where the, you know, we knew the fish were fairly abundant, but it's not a high uh, abundance area really of the fish either. So what is a unified method? It's been used for decades in China to harvest shallow lakes. I I first read of the high catch as possible um, up to 85% of the uh, target fish while reviewing a book chapter and decided I really wanted a piece of that action for uh, use in the United States. So our colleagues in Wuhan were very gracious in, in arranging for Kevin Irons and, and me to get some training directly from the very generous proprietors of businesses that use this method to use very large lakes as culture facilities and harvest them. They essentially use a floodplain lake that can be thousands of hectares and, and as a culture pond. And this is the way they get the fish out. It was developed primarily for big headed carps. When I say big headed carp, I mean silver carp and, and big head carp primarily. The, in, instead of going to a, a place, you know, in our traditional fisheries, we would go to a place where we think we can catch a bunch of fish. We set some nets and, and we pull those nets and catch the fish that we're able to catch. In this case, the unified method uh, is as done in China, you use the, you fish the water body as a single unit. You sequentially drive fish from little portions of the unit and, and block them off from returning using block nets. And you concentrate the fish near these very large trap net where the fish are removed daily. This is very low tech. It's, it takes months to get through one of these, uh, and it's it's a very gradual fish removal, which is what they want because of, you know, they want to be able to get all their fish to market live. We, we definitely don't want to do things in exactly that way. The picture on the side there uh, shows the first USGS-led unified method or modified unified method, one of the other. We, we were just really beginning on the modifications at that point. This this one is the first one that really used side scan sonar and integrated into the system. And But you can see that we laid a lot of nets there. There's about 20 miles of nets right there that are laid, which really we only had two miles and you leapfrog the nets as you move forward. But in particular design, with that many nets, we would never do that again now in that way because it's we've learned that you can be much more efficient. You don't need to do, with the, the driving methods we have, we've developed that you don't need to do it quite so energy intensively. And we use seines, which are a lot faster than the trap netting method to remove the fish. And those three seines up at the top that, that are indicated by the white semicircle resulted in a capture of 240,000 pounds of carp out of this lake, which in uh, later harvest estimates, looks like it's somewhere between 60 and 80 percent of the carp that of the silver carp and big headed carp together that were in the lake. So let's see. So why would you why this method works is it basically exploits the big headed carp behavior. They they're more prone to their native fish to run away as a, as a response to disturbance. The big headed carps are less susceptible to traditional North American fishing techniques, but they are vulnerable to the mung because of the way they dry. And we we're able to get. Uh, very low bycatch and very high capture rates in this process. So we use broadcast sound underwater speakers and uh, specialized electrofishing with, that doesn't kill the fish, it helps drive them. We don't want to attract the fish or, or you know, result in a, electro. You can bring the fish to you with an electrofishing gear, but we want to do the opposite. So, and we use side scan sonar for real-time monitoring of these school locations. That allows the use of much larger cells so we don't have to use quite so many nets. We can, and we can drive the fish faster with less labor, fewer nets. 
which is also different from the original one we use as sayings. I, I think you can see a picture of there, some people uh, in, in a boat. I'm not certain which picture you're, you, it seems like I'm getting both pictures here. But anyway, the sayings are what we use to pull the net. So managers have very few tools to detect carp at low abundance or respond to uh, rapid intro, uh, ra respond rapidly to an introduction. And to me, this modified unified method had obvious potential early on as we started to use this thing as an early detection of rapid response method. And in fact, I was promoting this method as potential rapid response tool in up to five years ago, which is right after we've started using the thing for the first time here in the United States. And I first started communicating with the Minnesota DNR folks about trialing it up there about four years ago, but it has taken a, a long time uh, for that kind of thing to come together. But we were able to finally get it going this year, wonderfully. The, so, you know, the reason that we want to trial this is because that A is useful for detection of early detection of CART, but it's also fraught with a lot of problems because there's a lot of ways to move DNA around, and we have these huge DNA sources when, where you have high populations of carp that and allows that DNA to get moved around. Big-headed carps are very crypt cryptic, and, and they avoid nets and boats, and so they're kind of hard to catch, especially when they're rare. And another thing that the most common method we have to go in and look for fish, the most common traditional method, is the gill net. And gill net is extremely size selective for big headed carps because of their body morphology. You're not, you're only going to catch fish within a certain very tight range as associated with the size of your mesh. And if you've got fish that are uh, small, they just won't get caught at all. You can't because small fish, even regardless of the size of the mesh you're using, won't, won't gill for big headed carps. We, we were able to, we thought that this would be a, a good way to trial and, and capture these big headed carps in rapid response situation. Also wanted to point out that, that, you know, people, that silver carp jump a lot. And people have this concept that if you drive around and you're going to see them jumping, well, that's true where they're very, very uh, abundant. But silver carp will jump over nets where there's, during a mum, they don't jump very much where they're rare. But in a mom situation where you're putting a, a seine around them, they definitely will get airborne and that allows them to, to escape. But, you know, by the way, big head carp, which we didn't catch any of uh, because big head carp are getting kind of rare out there these days. They're, the silver carp are kind of out competing them everywhere. But big head carp don't jump nets and we find them to be extremely easy to catch in a seine. So they're really more susceptible than silver carp to the mom to be actually being caught. But however, you know, they're very, very obvious when they jump. And so this can be a problem for catching the fish, but we can also use it if we have spotters in place to use as a silver carp detection tool. So I'm going to pass it over to Jesse here. And Jesse, can you take on, take the, the screen? Uh, thank you, Dwayne. So as uh, Dwayne just described, the, the, the unified method as it's used in China, the modified unified method that we use to round up mass quantities of fish, this was an, an opportunity to use this as an early detection, or early response method. I have this picture up here from the first morning of, of, of our preliminary assessment using the unified method because it highlights, one, the, the complications of doing uh, th this type of research during a pandemic. This, uh, what are we talking about is, is fresh off the press just from last month, as well as coordinating multiple agencies, commercial fishers, both both state and federal agencies, and it, it's, it's not, a, not a small ordeal, particularly during the, the pandemic. So the Navigation Pool 8 of the Mississippi River is a complex network of backwaters or side channels, colloquially known as sloughs in the area. And this is ideal for herding carp because this provides some of those, those confined areas that Wayne just showed with that, that are typically made with nets. For this particular preliminary assessment, we had five locations, and one of those locations was uh, repeated throughout the, uh, the week. And we also had other locations, but many of these locations were not suitable due to high water at the time of the event, which, which caused two problems. One, flow. If we're going to put block nets out there and have substantial amounts of nets in the water, flow can become, can become incredibly uh, problematic as well as flooded areas become more difficult to get boats back into and to drive those fish out of. 
But these are obviously potential future sites. And as Wayne mentioned, there's already progress towards doing similar events this fall. These five sites I've highlighted here uh, on the map. Uh, as you can see, Navigation Pool 8 is near La Crosse, Wisconsin. These sites ranged in sizes um, from very large sites, such as the airport sloughs, to incredibly uh, small sites, such as Cat Gut Slough. And the Bluff Slough was actually the site that was sampled twice during the week. As Duane mentioned, we used electrofishing boats as well as sound boats to herd the fish. On all of these sites, we used two electrofishing boats as well as two boats, each with two speakers, underwater speakers. We had a commercial fishing operation that was in charge of uh, same being, which you can see in that the bottom right uh, image, the same being deployed as the electrofishing boats and sound boats are trying to push fish around that, that around the enclosed area that's being uh, closed off by the same. In the upper left-hand corner, you see one of our research vessels that we use to deploy all of those nets that has a, a hydraulic net wheel on the front, which makes picking up these nets uh, substantially easier as well as processing fish. So I won't go through all of our sites here, but just to give a representation of what all of what some of these sites look like. Here's Cat Gut Slough, a very small site, uh, only 3,000 foot seines, as you can see, designated by those white bars. And we did actually drive from the, the lower portion of the picture here. We, drew, we drove or herded fish for a, a longer stretch into this area. I would also like to point out that there's a, a bathymetry layer on this Google, Google map image that shows this purple area in the seining zone, which is deeper. This is done by design. It's, it's much more difficult to herd fish to shallower areas than it is to herd fish to deeper areas. So we try to take advantage of this during our planning. So again, just for representation, here's Catgut Slough. Here's the I-90 Scour. This is an interstate, interstate 90 here, north is to the left. I will point out that this, this was supposed to be two locations on, on or two uh, sites on our original planning. But this downstream location had to be abandoned to substantial flow coming through this area, making it unable to set line. We did, however, sample the upstream area that has the deepest portion at that particular site. And then for the other end of the spectrum, in terms of scale, the airport slough located near La Crosse's airport, Lake Owen, Alaska, towards the, towards the left. As you can see, we drove a very, very large channel down into the, the capture zone or sane zone and had marinas as well as uh, a variety of cells that were that were driven. So in summary, 31 silver carp were captured. 29 of those are in the boat here, upper left, excuse me, upper right hand picture. We also observed 42 silver carp that were not captured, but were observed and confirmed. And I'd like to point out that this is not possible, typically, as Dwayne just mentioned, when we don't have nets in the water and are not causing a commotion. At low densities, you just don't see silver carp jump out of the water. However, once you get them you know, somewhat into a frenzy, put nets in the water, they get scared, and then they do jump. I will also point out that all five of the sites that we sampled as part of this, this early detection using the modified unified method were actually seen the following week and at four of those five sites, we did not observe any fish. And so we observed them at, at nearly every site, and they weren't observed without that extra driving. The one exception to this was the Bluff Slough, where they, they same three fish, and they observed two fish. Another thing I would like to point out, even though this is just uh, very, very preliminary, is just showing that the population characteristics of, of, of some of the fish that were sampled, as you can see, we don't really see fish smaller than 720 millimeters. I will point out that all of these fish over 6,000 grams, or 6 kilograms, were females, and that those females had ovaries or egg weights of up to 15% of their, their body weight, which would be potentially expected given the time of the year. So, Duane had already somewhat mentioned this, so I'll go incredibly quick here. We substantially increased the number of all-time detections. You can actually see this on the non-indigenous aquatic species database that was talked about earlier today. There were only 46 silver carp captured previously, and we observed 73 during our time. We detected carp at 80% of our sites, and when it was revisited, they only uh, detected carp at 20% at or one of those five sites. And future directions will continue 
to, to locate areas that can be sampled using this method. And that will also incorporate simultaneous eDNA sampling to map these areas before and after the MUM events and to give us some idea of quantification of, of load detections. I'm just going to end right here because I know I'm out of time, but this was obviously uh, a very well received, well received event by news agencies as, as, as well as those, those state and federal agencies that we work with. Okay, thank you, Jesse, and thank you, Duane, for presenting on the unified method on how it's been used to both capture fish and detect early at new locations. We are at 11 o'clock, time for our next speaker to start. So if anyone has any questions for Jesse or Duane, please enter those into the question and answer box or into the chat. And our next speaker will be Jim Dunker, at the Central Midwest Water Science Center, who will talk to us about real-time telemetry as an early detection tool. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, thank you, Patrick. I'm Jim Dunker. I'm a hydrologist in the Central Midwest Water Science Center. I sit in Urbana, Illinois, and I want to talk today about two applications of near real-time telemetry methods, but, you know, one of the, as they are applied to invasive carps, and, but, you know, I want to emphasize, while I'll talk about the techniques and the instrumentation, you know, I really want to emphasize that, you know, the, the cross-discipline and cross-missionary aspect of this work. Prior to our work with invasive big head carp starting back in the 2000s or so, we really didn't do, you know, we, were, we tended to stay in water mission area projects. We tended to stay in our silos and really didn't, didn't interact much with the other mission areas and, and not much outside of the water discipline. So this was, you know, I'm going to try and emphasize that through the talk because I, I think it's a key, key component and a really unique opportunity that, that's developed over time. But so invasive big-headed carp have, you know, this group knows well, they're becoming established in waters in the U.S. and they pose a significant biological threat to native species and ecosystems. And so uh, a telemetry project, it's not unusual to have a lot of partners, and this one is no different. And I don't want to, you know, I was worried that I was going to miss different partners, but I think I captured most of them here. But uh, a lot of different groups are tagging fish and sharing that information. And so I'd be remiss if I didn't try and include all the different groups here. But, so where it all started, you know, I, I want to tell this story of collaboration on this project. And, and where it all started, there's some key people, but we were working in the Illinois River Basin and with invasive carp escaping to the wild back in the 1970s timeframe, they moved pretty quickly up the Illinois River Basin. And on the left, you'll see a sort of a tilted version, a map of the uh, Illinois River with the mouth near Grafton and the connection through the Chicago area waterway system to Lake Michigan. And so they moved pretty rapidly up the, the waterway and becoming established in the lower river and pose a threat to, to the waterway connection of the cause. And so this, this map is both a, a map view and a profile view, and beneath that is the profile. And so the Illinois waterway is really a series of reservoirs, eight dam, lock and dams managed by the Corps. And the carp very quickly became established in the lower river. And up until about 2010 or so, the leading edge of the population front has remained in the Dresden Island pool. And you can see the profile of the river changes and, and as you pass through the different lock and dams. And the red dots there indicate where we have real-time telemetry. But I'd like to point out a few key people. You know, our collaboration on invasive carp and with a biologist in, in our center, in our water science center, began with a almost accidental conversations that we happened to be at a meeting in EPA in Chicago with, with Dwayne Chapman and Ryan Jackson and I, you know, fondly remember just, you know, coincidental conversations that led to uh, a lot of collaboration over time, you know, kind of the Reese's peanut butter and chocolate story, you know, Dwayne came to us with some questions about hydrodynamics and, and Doppler meter, Doppler ADCPs, you know, which was, was our wheelhouse and we learned a whole lot about invasive carp. But so that's grown over time, but Jim Garvey, shown here in the center, professor at Southern Illinois University, and they had early on established, began tagging a lot of, of carp throughout the, the Illinois waterway. And so we started talking about the life cycle of carp and, and how they have this network of standalone receivers. And, and, and we were both interested in, in 
linking the life cycle of, of carp with the, the hydrologic data that a water science center collects. And so uh, that conversation brought us to uh, Mary Beth Bray, one of Jim's postdocs at the time, but now a biologist at the Upper Mississippi Environmental Sciences Center in, in La Crosse for the USGS. And the collaboration has grown over time, but you know, Mary Beth and I had ideas about how we could put together a database of, that would include both carp fish data with, and, and locations and detections with the hydrologic data that we collect on the waterway. So, so that was kind of the, where it all started and it's grown since then. Our original objectives on the Illinois waterway were to, you know, monitor the population, the, the status of each pool. And so the, the lower, these maps show the lower waterway where carp are established. We have uh, a, a number of age classes from, and we, we, they routinely collect eggs and larvae and juvenile fish and adults. And there's, you know, since those two, the year two, in early 2000s, there's been a coordinated effort to try and fish down the leading edge of the population and also to collect a lot of data on eggs and larvae. And so we, we really cut our teeth and learned a lot about the Asian carp life cycle in the Illinois waterway and, and, and developed some of the telemetry tools. And using that, those tools, we're able to, you know, track movement of individually tagged fish, you know, look at seasonal patterns of those movements. And initially we thought we'd, we'd use the data to guide harvest. And I'll talk a little bit about that, but different locations of congregations of fish. And then one of the key things that came out of this were contingency plans. So a multi-agency group meets several times a year but we run through a tabletop exercise and we go pool by pool and review the status of fish in of the population in those pools. And the, you know, as I mentioned, the population front has really stalled out since about 2010 downstream of Chicago, you know, below the Chicago area waterway system. You know, we, we get occasional fish that runs further upstream, but the bulk of the population, they have commercial fishermen working the, the pools to remove fish, but routinely the fish are that leading edge of the population is found in the Dresden Island pool. And so we're using telemetry to kind of, you know, provide that information on, on what's happening in the different pools of Illinois. So the setup is actually pretty simple. It's, it's the telemetry setup. It's things we use on, you know, across the country, every water science center does things, transmits data using telemetry, different instruments in different centers, but are pretty much the same. This is a, the gauge house portion, an electronic data logger with a cell modem. It's powered by a solar panel. It runs off 12 volt. And we are able to work with the manufacturer to take the network of receivers. These are typically deployed as standalone and downloaded periodically acoustic receivers for tracking the fish. We are able to work with the manufacturer and get a cabled receiver and then look at their data stream coming off the, the, you know, how they store and archive the data. And so we were able to look at that data stream. It's RS-232 signals that are, we were able to decode it and program it and split the data up and provide some logic. I won't go through the code, but it was, it was, it wasn't trivial, but it wasn't that complicated to put that into our data logger, transmit it either cell modem or uh, satellite antenna back to our office and be able to put that data, that tag detection, that fish detection data onto a web page that's updated hourly. So near, near real time, and that information is out there for the biologists and the management agencies to use for, for, very, for, for various reasons. So moving away from that effort in the Illinois River and the Illinois Waterway, you know, we really cut our teeth and began working with the biologists and learn, you know, about what their needs were in terms of real-time telemetry or near real-time telemetry. And then a few years ago, Patrick and others came to us and, and said, could we use, you know, deploy some of that same real-time telemetry equipment to the Lake Erie tributaries. So we deployed a number of setups to, in the Sandusky River, the Maumee and the Plum Creek or the Hot Pond site. These are pictures of each. They're, they're standalone setups. You know, I mentioned they run off of 12 volt. We provide solar panels to keep them charged up, but it's transmitting data, fish detections on an hourly basis to back to our office and put on put onto the web and made available to, to the management agencies. And in the, uh, so this is what, this is an example of what our web page looks like. It's Sandusky River at Brady's Island. 
at Fremont, Ohio. And so we, we see a, a detection and the data is, is logged in five minute in increments and we record a number of parameters on site, but what we're looking at is the tag ID. And so the management agencies, you know, recognize their tag IDs and can, can respond to this information. So the, this is an, another example, you know, we can distribute that information out to the interested parties through a variety of, of, of methods. You know, we, we, we post it on the web, we can send an alert to individuals as far as either a text message or an email in this case, you know, to, to show a location and, and if, if they're looking for specific tags or any, any newly detected tags in the last 24 hours. So here we're showing a couple of tag detections that were grass carp. I've redacted part of the tag IDs. You know, the, the, the information is out there for the public and as a public agency, we have to do that. But there are groups when you have multiple agencies working together, there's groups that want to protect some of that information. So in the Illinois, it was agreed upon, you know, we actually put onto the web what, what species they are, but in some cases that's not that, that's not desired. So we just, we just simply locate the tag ID and the different agencies have an index for what that, what fish those are. And in, in the Lake Erie tributaries, it's a completely different setup for us. So in the telemetry in the Illinois, you know, where we had established populations and large numbers of fish in the lower waterway and relatively large numbers of fish all the way up to, towards the leading edge of the population front, but over in Lake Erie Tribs, we're, you know, dealing with grass carp and looking at a completely different setting where, you know, we're relatively low abundance and the agencies are using this information for their grass carp strike teams. So a detection can be used by the agency, you know, uh, understanding that the fish school and a uh, Judas fish approach where a tag fish is revealing the potential location of, of other grass carp. And so the agencies can respond with strike teams to a location and, and work to remove those fish. So while we're still contributing to the overall understanding, you know, the patterns of their movement and, and habitat use, it's being used in, in a, different, a different approach than, than how the, that telemetry data was first used over in the Illinois. Current and future status, you know, we worked with the manufacturer to develop these real-time systems. And it wasn't trivial on our part, but it, you know, the telemetry portion was something we understood very well and adapting it to work with the, the telemetry receivers, the acoustic receivers. So we have expanded our network in the last few years and we're up to around 20, 25 locations, both in Mississippi, the Illinois, and some of the uh, Lake Erie tribs. But the manufacturer, you know, saw what we were doing and they now offer their own turnkey a system that includes cloud-based storage, real-time alerts, post-processing tools and, and visualization tools. And it, it's, it's really a slick product, you know, you know, this was developed by, our system was developed by hydrologists and, and is very rudimentary compared to what the manufacturer offers today. So we felt, you know, and we've talked, we, we have a good relationship with the manufacturer and we've talked about the different tools that they have and, and it is really a, a pretty nice product. It, it comes at, at an additional uh, cost, but it's kind of the next, it's kind of the direction that the telemetry tools are, are going towards. So, you know, all I see is that, you know, improvements in the, in the near future in, in telemetry, uh, as far as uh, a more widespread use and its application to other other species. But with that, I'm open to questions. I can be reached at this contact information. And it's just been, you know, I just emphasize, you know, the, the cross-discipline and cross-missionary aspect of this whole effort over the past 10, 15 years has been really pretty unique, very, you know, very enjoyable from our standpoint. And, you know, it's something, I think it could be a model for, for other, others in the USGS. Any, any questions? Yeah, thank you, Jim, for that uh, presentation and for pointing out the importance of these collaborations in multiple, multiple different forms that they take. It's very important to conducting the research necessary to support our management partners. Uh, are there any questions for Jim? I don't see anything in the chat or the Q&A right now. Does anyone have a question they'd like to ask? Ask. Usually cost comes up, I, you know, just ballpark, about ten to $11,000 worth of equipment. 
and we were charging about fourth for operation and maintenance. You know, there's the backside of the database and setting up the, the database. And you know, one of the things that often comes up is, and it's been, is a hurdle that we, we got past were the data privacy and data sharing issues. And those are, those are pretty, you know, when you have so many agencies working together and, you know, there was concern in, at the start from SIU was, you know, would we be putting data out there as a public agency that we have to, that would take away from uh, a grad student's thesis. And I think they quickly realized there is a lot of data out there and that really never, never happened. But we, we still run into, you know, different agencies have different thoughts about having their data public and how that is help, dealt with on an agency level. It, it does present a, a challenge and so far we've been able to work through it, but. So again, I'm Cindy Kolar Tam and I'm the program coordinator for the Biological Threats and Invasive Species Research Program at USGS. And in this little section, we have two talks that look at. It, it's something that, that can kind of toss a wrench into the into the process. Great, uh, thanks very much, Jim. And thank you also to Duane and Jesse and Ryan and Adam for their presentation this morning. That concludes the second portion of our program. And now I'll turn it back over to Cindy for our next short section of two presentations. Cindy? Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, everyone. So first we're gonna have Mike Adams, who's gonna talk about preparing for BSAL in the US. And Mike is with the Forest and Rangeland Ecological Research Center. And then we're gonna hear from Catherine Jarnovich and she's gonna talk about Inhabit, communicating invasive plant distribution models to inform detection and monitoring. And Catherine's from the Fort Collins Science Center. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm Mike Adams, I'm located in Corvallis, Oregon. I'm the lead for our amphibian program at USGS, which is called ARMY for short, the Amphibian Research and Monitoring Initiative. And uh, I'm gonna talk about B-cell today. I'm not sure how, you know, how much broad awareness there is of B-cell. Yeah, so B-cell, it's a big issue in the world of amphibians. It's a problem in Europe, but I'm not sure how aware everybody is of this. So I just want to go over a little bit what the threat is and, and the opportunity that we have to be prepared for this problem. It's not quite here yet, and just some of the things that we're doing about it. So first of all, B-cell is short for Batrachochytrium salamandrosaurus. It's a fungal pathogen in the water mold family. It is the second water mold that we know of that affects amphibians. The first was BD, which we've known of for quite a while. BD is the trachochytrium dendrobotitis. And uh, BD is a major factor in global amphibian declines. It uh, has led to numerous species. It's led to some apparent extinctions around the world. And, and it's a big problem. And so it's also a big concern to us when we um, discovered the second pathogen uh, a few years ago associated with the dioxin salamanders in Europe. So that was the initial discovery and description of this pathogen. After that, it was discovered that it, well, it appeared to be native in Southeast Asia. It it's, uh, seems to be endemic there and not causing problems. It's associated with some fairly high elevation species and species that are fairly common in the pet trade. And so there's a lot of opportunity for this pathogen to move around. And it appears to have arrived in Europe via the pet trade. And so we're concerned about that as well with, um, with, with both salamanders and, and frogs. Uh, a lot of people don't know, but the U.S. has the highest salamander diversity in the world. It's a, a, a somewhat remarkable thing you expect it to be in the tropics or something like that, but nope, the uh, United States highest diversity in the world of salamanders, really remarkably high diversity in, in Appalachia. Other places as well, the West Coast has fairly high diversity. And we know of a growing list, I guess, of species that are susceptible to B-cell. There's challenge studies underway, you know, various labs involved in that. And uh, so we know we have a number of species that are susceptible. So we're really quite concerned about this thing arriving arriving in the U.S. And one of the first things we did at USGS when, when this, this pathogen was described was to analyze the risk on a county-by-county county basis. This was led by Katie Riggles at the National Wildlife Health Center. And we used, oh, I'm forgetting now, I think a dozen or so different factors of the information available at the county level that we thought were associated with some form of risk. 
basically boils down to risk that um, B cell might arrive and risk of the harm that it might cause. And so this is uh, just the, the sort of overall summary of, of that combined. And recently worked on revising that with some information that's come available. And the next thing we did was go and look for it. Uh, a lot of us felt like B cell probably was already here at the time that we knew about this in Europe and, and that we just didn't know about it. And so one of the things the Army program did was, this was actually with help from Cindy's program, was to go out and uh, do a pretty large effort looking for B-cell in wild populations as a, a guide to where we focused most of our effort, but we looked other places as well. And we managed to swab about 12,000 of them. A little bit of water sampling as well, just to mess with that methodology. We did not find it, nor has anybody found B-cell in, in, in North America at all. This was by far the biggest effort looking for it, but there's a lot of people. So um, not finding it seems to suggest that we really do have the opportunity to prevent B-cell from arriving in the U.S., number one, and number two, to prepare for its arrival. So if it is discovered, we're able to respond in some sort of effective fashion. It's a little bit unusual to have this kind of advanced warning of a, a pathogen like this and something you want to take advantage of. I mean, the most effective thing that's happened in terms of prevention and preparation, I suppose, is the, the rule that the Fish and Wildlife Service put in place. It's an interim rule that lists about 20 genera of salamander as injurious and the lacy act and therefore bans importation of those salamanders. So that's a major step in um, preventing B-cell from arriving. We've, we've, we've since found that frogs also, they don't uh, seem to die from this pathogen, at least not that we've seen so far, but they can carry it. Uh, so that's an additional concern, but this was a major step to help prevent B-cell from. Another thing that we did we pretty rapidly after information about this pathogen started to emerge, we organized a workshop, Army, program hosted this at the Howell Center in Fort Collins. And people from around the world with experience both with B-cell and with BD and, and other pathogens, I suppose, you know, to help us think about what could be done to kind of get organized and prepared for the expected discovery of, of B-cell in, in the U.S. And we, we really just sort of rolled around a bunch of different actions that could be taken in kind of different dimensions of things that we could put into motion as opposed to, to prepare. And I'll just go over kind of a few things that have resulted from that. Uh, a lot of this just still ongoing. Um, probably the most important thing is we really just got ourselves organized and formed this task force with a, a, a structure as opposed to moving the needle on, on some of the different aspects of what needed to be done. And uh, most of this exists. We have a technical advisory committee that meets monthly and has been for, for several years now. And uh, these working groups that have evolved a little bit over the years but are quite active. Some of these with, with uh, a, a large number, which I think there's probably, I want to say about 50 core people involved in the task force overall, but uh, closer maybe to 100 even that's in their peripheral involvement. Um, so it's pretty active, most of these groups with this oversight group. This does not exist in the current competition. Raise conversations going on about that. The rest of this exists, and this has been a pretty effective way that get a lot of things done and keep a lot of conversations going. Why the communication open? You can find a lot about the task force and products of the task force on the salamanderfungus.org website. It's the home of the task force. And one of the important products has been this response plan template that was completed. So, two or three years ago now, I would say. It is a template. It's, it's a document that's meant to be used in advance to kind of think through what might happen if you discover B-cell in your, your sort of local area of interest. It probably could be used off the shelf, you know, if you do find B-cell and consult this thing and, and, and find that useful, but it's meant to be worked through in advance or like few blanks. So there, I, I guess I should say there's not a, a lot of really clear management options for B-cell. There's various things that are being thought about. A lot of the things that I think would be considered pretty drastic actions and, and pretty experimental. So uncertain outcome and probably they would have other undesirable effects. And so those things would have to be really 
response plan doesn't get too deep into those kinds of things, but it, it deals a lot with the, the, the layers of information that might be available you know, in terms of what's known about a detection and communication that would occur in some of the early steps. There's definitely a lot more to do in terms of forming a plan for response. I'll say a little bit more about that later. But this thing does exist in, in the first you know, hours and days after detection. And I'll mention some of the things that the Army program is doing. First of all, I, I think I already said that risk model just recently revised that with the Fish and Wildlife Service. And I think we'll be out in a matter of weeks, certainly within a few months. There's several versions of that, I should say, as well. Other people have done risk models. There's different ways to think about it. There's a great bit of uncertainty and like that. But I would say that the, the different models qualitatively agree. And um, I don't know, depending on, uh, on maybe what you're interested in, using the consultant. A big thing that the Army program's been doing is trying to think about environmental effects on disease outcomes. And we have a oh, you know, continental scale uh, research project that's underway right now. With, I mean, the notion that you know, number one disease in general is a, a major factor in disease declines, and, and I would say a, a growing factor just in wildlife management in general. And just trying to understand better, at least for amphibian populations, how the local conditions are influencing outcomes when, when uh, a veterinary pathogen is present. And so that's a study that's focused on DD, of course, because that's what we have here, but we think that it might be population responses in that is that is found. And then I'll just mention two final things here, surveillance and decision support. It's it's it obviously it would be really desirable to have a very robust early detection surveillance network in place. We've not, basically nobody has the resources to really do something that just seems comprehensive enough. That effort that, that the Army program did, pretty expensive effort, not something that we could sustain. There's various people doing sampling and there's conversations about coordination of that or some effectiveness as opposed to um, some of what's going on. But the thing that I think has really good traction right now, and certainly has a lot of energy behind it, is the, this thing called the SNAPS program, Student Network for Amphibian Pathogen Surveillance. And this is an effort to get university classes involved in pathogen surveillance and to develop learning modules that incorporate sampling in the field into various types of university classes. So we've developed these modules. Those are they're better ready for um, instructors to use. And we've developed this system for you know sending out the material, you know, instructions, and, and various things that have to be done to do the sampling in the field and then you know, doing the analysis. The Army program is funding the, the laboratory work right now at the National Wildlife Health Center. And the data go to a thing called the Amphibian Disease Portal, which is an you know, kind of sprung out of a task force development. And publicly available database. And so this thing is uh, early, it, it's in the development stage right now. We have uh, half a dozen or so institutions involved. <clears throat> and we're getting ready to move into a growth phase as we wrap up getting, getting the thing designed. We just a few weeks ago had a really great meeting with um, representatives from Canadian government agencies and academic institutions, and they're starting to, to, to figure out how to join the SNAPs as well as they can get involved in this. So we hope that this thing will grow in its footprint and be a useful component at least of early detection network. That's the most uh, coordinated thing going on right now. It's a product of the um, surveillance working group from the task force. And then finally, I, I, I mentioned the difficulty of you know, developing management responses. We, we feel like we know a fair bit about the complexities of decision-making that would be necessary if PSAL is discovered. And we have a decision support working group that's part of the task force that's led by Evan Grant. We're, we're basically looking for opportunities to engage with people that would be tasked with really you know, responding to a PSAL detection and kind of work through some of the problems that we know will occur. A few years ago, Camille Hawkins organized a sort of tabletop exercise where we worked through some of the uh, you know, just, just with, a, with, a, with a small group, basically work through what would happen under some made up scenario of discovering B cell. That gave us some insights into the problems that will occur and, and kind of the, the hurdles that we have to be overcome. But we've struggled a little bit to find people that are willing to engage in this sort of a, you know, kind of a, a structured decision making exercise. The problem being that everybody has enough issues, you know, that they're already dealing with, that it's hard to make time to deal with this thing that. Uh, 
on investment. So that's kind of hanging out there as an opportunity. It's interesting that with white nose syndrome, there, there's quite a bit of engagement in this process. We're trying to actually just do that as parallel efforts, far away from nation, surprising as it could be other. Um, but it's been more difficult to get engagement on. So, and so just, just to summarize, we can hope that B-cell will not arrive in, in North America, but we, we expect that it will just sort of given um, what seems to happen with these pathogens and invasive species and the way things move around these days. So it seems difficult to keep out. And so, you know, we have the opportunity to prepare for it and, and, and we want to take full advantage of that. There's a lot of efforts underway. To, to do exactly that. But particular opportunities for doing better are in the realm of surveillance and the early detection network, um, the decision analysis that I just mentioned. And I don't think I didn't mention, but we have a newly formed working group that's trying to think about being trade program as well. That might be another important aspect of having uh, you know, a robust approach to prevention. So that's all I have. Thank you, Mike. I see that there's one question in the, in the Q&A with a clarification. Do you see that BD ineffectively is affected? I think that's true for B-cell. B-cell prefers colder temperatures, so better at colder temperatures. I, I think I mentioned that in its native range, it's associated with some fairly high elevation species. And so the environmental tolerance is different, but it, it does have a, a certain range of preferred temperatures. I had a question as well. So you said that you expect B cell to get here, even though regulatory action was taken and it hasn't gotten here yet. So do you have an idea of how it's expected to get here? And is there more that could be done? Well, the, the pet trade still, I think, would be the most likely mechanism. And the, the big gap that we know about right now is the importation of frogs. We've got the um, ban in place for for many salamanders, but we don't have it for frogs. We know it can move around on frogs. We're not sure how much that is actually happening, but I think that would be the most likely mechanism. Locally, we know of just a, like a little bit about moving around. I think there's actually one paper on being found on um, goose legs or ducks or something, but yeah. That trade, I think, is the most likely way to go. So do you think there's anything else that we can do to decrease that risk? Well, I think that the, the you know, looking at the, the frogs in terms of the importation ban, and I think the clean, clean trade program would be another way to deal with that. Beyond that, I don't have any ideas about that. Hard problem. Anyone, anything else for, for Mike? Thank you. Thank you. And the last talk in this section is going to be given by Catherine Jarnovich. Catherine, are you ready? I think I'll be doing your slides, right? Thanks. So I'm going to talk to you today about a project that evolved from discussions between invasive species researchers at my science center and the National Park Service invasive species coordinators. So the Fort Collins Science Center where I work we have a long history of co-producing species distribution models for invasive species to inform management decisions at different scales. So the land managers need tools to help them make strategic decisions about where to focus limited resources to best address invasive plant control, because there's a lot more species and issues out there than anyone can possibly address. And within the Park Service, they have invasive plant management teams that are regional teams that contribute to surveillance and control of invasive plant species to, and to restoration efforts at multiple parks within their regions. They also aid local managers through consultation and providing training in invasive plant management techniques, but they have limited resources to address invasive species. So I wanna give you an overview of what species distribution models are that I was talking about. So these types of models, we use information that's known about where species occur. And for invasive species or particular plant species, there's a lot of weed mapping data that's collected data by citizen scientists and other sources of information that are aggregated into different databases, such as the one that Wes talked about earlier, the NAS database, but there um, are several different ones out there. And so we can use this existing information and integrate it with information about the environmental characteristics where these species are found, such as temperature or precipitation, soils information, and create determined relationships between where the species is found and these environmental characteristics that we can then use to produce maps of where a species might be found on the landscape, including areas that 
aren't surveyed. So what can these types of models be used for? And they can be used at different scales, including for regional risk assessment, and there's also local scale uses. But at a regional level, they could be used to determine what species might be in a region that you might be unaware of. They can be used to help develop watch lists for early detection and rapid response. And the importance of EDRR has been discussed by others already this morning. And generally, they can be used to help determine potential habitat for a species across a large region. At a more local scale, they could be used to help um, determine where you might be most likely to find patches of a species of concern to treat. So if you aren't able to survey everywhere, this could help target where you go look to do control efforts. And it can also help target where you look for satellite populations. Next slide. So I want to give a couple of examples of how these have been used to illustrate the utility. So for example, Working with USDA, we developed a national model for where gypsy moths might be expected to establish outside the area where they're already established in the country. And this model was then used to guide, help guide survey efforts that were conducted by USDA. And they were able to successfully detect introductions in the Pacific Northwest that they were then able to control before the species became established there. So here's a um, successful example of the use of these models. And similarly, we developed models for Elodia and aquatic weed for Alaska, that's non-native there, that they were able to use and help prioritizing where they might search for species. Next slide. And then there's also examples for a local targeting. Next slide. So here, there's an image showing cheatgrass invading a burned landscape in southeastern Wyoming. And we are able to create a model for predicting where cheatgrass was on the landscape that was then used to target control efforts. Next slide. And similarly, within Wisconsin, working with the Department of Natural Resources there and other agencies, we are able to develop models for uh, several species of concern, including wild parsnip, and using these models to guide where surveys were conducted to find new locations was more successful than kind of their business as usual approach. Next slide. So there's lots of suitability models that exist out there. We've shown that they can be useful, but there's often a divide between researchers who are creating these models and practitioners who might find them useful in informing land management actions. And so talking with the Park Service Invasive Species Coordinators, we were trying to come up with a way that something that we could develop that would facilitate delivery of this information into the hands of people that need it. So we talked with invasive plant management teams, and there were a couple different teams that came up with species in each of their regions that we could develop a pilot for. And we were able to participate in the team's biannual meeting in person to talk with them and get some information from them on what might be useful. Next slide. So the two species that were the pilot species were fountain grass, which is found in the southwestern United States, and wavy leaf basket grass in the eastern U.S. So we developed models of these species. We were able to meet with the teams, talk about them and the information that they display. Here's one model, the values range from zero to one as a habitat suitability index, where higher values indicate higher habitat suitability. But often people are more interested in having a binary map of what's suitable, not suitable. Next slide. And so you could choose a value between zero and one to make a map that defines uh, suitable, not suitable. But how you choose that threshold to define it will result in more or less suitable habitat being shown. So the one on the left is a more inclusive approach where more habitat is predicted as being suitable, whereas the one on the left is a more target ap targeted approach where we have less suitable habitat being shown. And there may be, depending on the intended use of the model, the people on the ground may want one or the other of these. Next slide. So for this meeting, we'd also come up with kind of a mock-up of what a delivery tool might look like, including a map. Here we're um, showing 
Joshua Tree National Park with the model for fountain grass. And again, showing a couple different thresholds to define habitat as suitable, unsuitable. So more conservative threshold again on the bottom that shows more habitat as suitable and a more liberal threshold that shows kind of a more targeted view of habitat for this species. And so through discussions with them, we were able to come up with information on desired content and design for a tool to deliver this information. Next slide. So after that meeting, we developed an initial version of a tool that had a map as the landing page. There's a slider bar for different thresholds. Initially, there were six different ones that were included. And we had 30 different species suggested by different invasive plant management teams to cover different regions of the continental U.S. that we initially developed models for. Next slide. So the current status of this tool is we now have a URL that anybody can access and get to. The tool is called the Invasive Species Habitat Tool or Inhabit. It's continued to evolve through a workshop, through presentations both at scientific meetings where resource managers often attend and through more targeted presentations to invasive species management groups, as well as calls to obtain feedback on what should be included and the best delivery means. We currently have models for around 140 invasive terrestrial plant species that have been identified mostly by DOI partners in Park Service, Fish and Wildlife, and Bureau of Land Management but there's also an option on the, the website to suggest additional species that people think would be useful to have included. Next slide. So here's a screenshot of the current landing page for the website. And in the top left, you can select the species of interest. So it's a drop down menu with the different um, species that are currently included. We can also add management, units selected for BLM Fish and Wildlife Park Service counties or invasive plant management team regions to zoom, easily zoom into a specific location. And then we also have the slider bar that I talked about, although it's been somewhat simplified based on feedback. Next slide. So here's again is an image of the now four different thresholds you could select on that slider bar again, for fountain grass. So um, in the top left, you have the most precautionary, showing the most suitable habitat. And in the bottom, you have, again, the more targeted habitat. And there is also a link that you can click once you've selected a species to go download the layers behind these maps so that people could include, add them to like a tablet or something that they want to take into the field with them. Next slide. But there's also other tabs available on the website, including more information, more detailed information about the models themselves and what was included in them, as well as a uh, tab to provide feedback on the models or suggest new species. But what I, the other tab I'm going to focus on here, though, is the management area table. And so again, here you can select the species of interest in the top left. So here, perennial pepperweed is selected. And then a table that summarizes information for that species by management unit is what's shown. And so for each management unit, we've calculated the estimated suitable area for um, that species, the percent of the unit that's suitable, whether or not there's a known presence in the unit, and then the minimum distance to a known occurrence. So one of the occurrences that we use to develop the model. And so this type of information can help prioritize, at least for a particular species, which units might be most susceptible to a particular species. Next slide. And so here's an example from Joshua Tree National Park showing fountain grass again. And in the bottom, we've zoomed into an area of high habitat suitability where the park later collected locations, just showing the utility. And so given the utility um, of this Tool, it's going to become a part of the Park Service Integrated Pest Management and Invasive Species Project Kit, which provides step-by-step -step guidance for conducting invasive species and pest management. And it's also going to be highlighted as a tool for individual park managers planning prevention, EDRR, and control efforts. So future updates for the website. We're currently updating all species models with new location information and updated predictor set based on feedback and discussions with end users. 
And we're also updating the website based on feedback. So for example, here's a simplified map color scheme that we um, plan to integrate to the website. Next slide. And other potential future directions we've been looking at are moving from maps of predicting where a species might occur to a maps of where they might become abundant. Impact of invasive species generally scales with abundance. So in fact, higher impact, we have higher abundance. And so we may want to just focus in on areas where a species is abundant. So here's an example where the gold color represents habitat suitability for occurrence, and the blue is habitat suitability when we limit to locations where the plant species had 10% cover or more. And so it's a subset. Although some species we looked at, it ends up being more, more similar. Another thing that we plan to do with our revised models is to summarize species by management unit, where you could choose a location such as Joshua Tree National Park. And then for that park, you'd have the summary information by species. Next slide. We always welcome feedback via email or the website, species suggestions, tool improvements, etc. Here's my email and again the URL for the web tool. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, Catherine. That was terrific. I see that there is a question or two up there. Let me stop sharing. It's only plant species. And yes, currently it is only terrestrial plant species. And then somebody else, can the models be applied to high resolution satellite? data. I'm not exactly sure. We do have some predictor data that we use to create the models. And I didn't mention that the models are created at a 90 meter resolution for the continental U.S. And then do we have a time frame for summarizing species by management unit? We plan to have our new version of all the models for all 140 species created by October, and we hope to roll out that new summary at that same time. And at the moment, we aren't planning to include aquatic plants just because the sets of predictors and the things that you have to consider in developing the models are pretty different in an aquatic environment, but it's something we may look into in the future. User input climate change variances. We don't have that currently involved, included in the models, but we do have in the more details, you can see what climate predictors were included in the models and what the response curves look like. So you may be get, able to get some idea from that. That's all the questions. There. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. And thanks, Mike Adams as well. I appreciate your talks. And right now I am going to introduce Camille Hopkins and she's going to moderate the next few speakers. Camille is our wildlife disease uh, coordinator and she's been with us for, oh, probably going on close to five years now, I think. So thank you, Camille. Thank you, Cindy. And thank you everyone for joining. So when you think about wildlife disease dynamics, including zoonoses, those diseases shared between animals and humans, invasive species can really play a significant role. They can bring novel diseases into naive ecosystems. They can play a role in the dynamics of native or endemic diseases. And some wildlife diseases themselves are invasive or non-native pathogens. And these include different strains or versions of a disease that are not native to the U.S. So in other words, we have low pathogenic avian influenza, but then there's highly high pathogenic avian influenza. And finally, changes to our climate and to land use can lead to the spread of native diseases into areas where they previously had not been detected before. So biosurveillance is, is really critical for our field. And today you're going to hear about some of the tools that are available related to understanding the risk of disease spread to inform surveillance and conducting environmental surveillance. So tools to assist with that in the aquatic and the terrestrial realm. So our first speaker is Dr. Diane Prosser from the Eastern Ecological Science Center at Patuxent. Diane is a research wildlife ecologist and her research focuses on integrating field studies and spatial modeling to answer questions related to wildlife stressors such as climate change and disease. Her work on avian influenza and migratory bird movements began in 2005 when she visited China, the epicenter of novel avian influenza viral strains 
following the large wild bird outbreaks at Qinghai Lake. This effort led to a program that aims to expand our understanding of the role of wild birds in the persistence, amplification, and spread of avian influenza viruses, both internationally and within the U.S. Her presentation is titled Avian Influenza, the Wild Domestic Bird Interface, and I'll turn it over to Diane. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much, Camille, for the introduction. Um, I'm glad to be here and share this research with you today. Today, I'd like to share with you, the tool I would like to share with you are transmission risk models that are focused on the spread of avian influenza virus at the wild to domestic bird interface. And I will explain that a bit for, further in my talk. But these tools are important for helping guide the surveillance, early detection, management of invasive path pathogens such as avian influenza virus. And as part of the story today, I would also like to share some of the related avian e ecology studies that are really important to help inform um, the development of such models. I'm going to turn off my camera to save bandwidth and hopefully you can still see my screen. So what is avian influenza virus and the wild domestic bird interface and why is it important? So wild birds are the known uh, reservoir for low path avian influenza viruses, meaning non-lethal forms of the virus. So for example, these viruses have evolved with water bird species. It may be like you or I getting a small cold, maybe asymptomatic infection. The spread of these viruses within wild bird populations are usually the fecal to oral route where birds are feeding within shared aquatic environments and then picking up some virus through that cycle. And so it's when certain strains of the virus, particularly ones that might have surface proteins that are H5s or H7s, when they enter a, a large population such as domestic poultry, where it can mutate into a lethal form and cause death, particularly within uh, the poultry populations. Those are called highly pathogenic avian, avian influenza viruses and are defined by rapid death within these chicken populations. So historically, these forms of virus typically would, would cross a barrier into the domestic situation, amplify up, and then be contained, eradicated within the agricultural system. However, I'm gonna be talking about the evolution of some viruses, particularly related to the H5N1 virus and their descendants, where there's been a, a pretty significant evolutionary change where one, these viruses have been able to jump to humans. So there's a, a serious public health threat, particularly continuing in Asia, that's where it started. But also very importantly, now we seem to have this spillback from the domestic situation, a high path avian influenza virus that is going back to wild birds and it may or may not kill them. They may be asymptomatic, they may be able to move it. So it really changes the possibility of transmission within these populations, across to the domestic interface, as, as well as to the wild bird populations and humans. And these viruses have large economic implications to the agriculture industry, as well as human health. So some quick history here, speaking generally about the emergence of that H5N1 virus. So that, it emerged in 1996 in domestic geese in Southern China. Now, previous to this, most of the outbreaks were, were mainly in poultry and they were relatively infrequent. So this is globally, okay? Relatively in, infrequent, they were contained and stamped out. But as poultry production globally increased to the 90s, there were more outbreaks that were detected, but still within the poultry system. So in 1996, the H5N1 highly pathogenic virus emerged in domestic geese in southern China, and it was quiet for a bit. In 1997, it was detected um, in poultry, but also infected 18 humans, six of whom had died. And so Hong Kong had some strict controls. They were able to stamp it out, and things were quiet for a number of years until around 2003, late 2003, when it reemerged in China and spread to some local, you know, six or so local countries and is circulated there for a year or so. Then a significant event happened in the spring of 2005 in central China in a very remote region with very little poultry, very little human population. 
where more than 6,000 wild birds died. And this was, this was monumental because this really had not been recorded before. And so that's it continued to persist throughout the summer, but it was then later that summer and then early in the fall where the H5N1 virus was detected in Mongolia, Russia, eventually in the winter in Europe. And then in 2006, it moved to Africa. It was then circulating within this area for a number of years and descendants in late 2014, descendants of this virus, high path virus moved into the, the United States. And that's the first, North America, that's the first entry of these, this clade of high path viruses that moved into North America. So let's see. And it was this movement of virus out of central China and into these other areas that implicated wild birds, you know, reports that were coming out directly pointed to wild birds and that they were spreading this virus. Yet at that point in time, there really was little information on many different things related to, to these questions. The pathogenicity of the virus and different avian species, particularly wild bird species. Can wild bird species move with it? Um, if they could, what are their migratory connections? And we needed to improve our understanding as well of the interactions between the wild birds and the domestic birds at this interface. And that's where the, this work began for me in trying to improve our understanding of how wild birds might be involved in the spread of highly pathogenic avian influenza viruses. So here is a, a really cool map of mainly China and parts of Asia where you're seeing the brown and yellow are poultry densities. So here's China, this is Qinghai Lake, where that large wild bird outbreak occurred. And you can see that there are relatively few to no poultry up in that region. I went to China to try and, I had to go to where the virus was persisting and evolving in order to study some of these questions. So one research location was Qinghai Lake to better understand those birds that died, those species, and what those, their connectivities were and exposures to different risk risk uh, factors. And then there were outbreaks also in this very different part of China, which is down in the you know, lowland tropicals, lots of rice party paddy farming that is integrated with you know, free range duck farming. Humans live very closely with um, their livestock and with their poultry, yet it's also very important, particularly wintering area for migratory wild birds. Here you can see a picture in the Poyang Lake region where these free range ducks are moving from natural wetlands into the farm situation. So this early work that, that we did was some telemetry marking on number of waterfowl species that were involved in outbreaks from those two, two locations. Our main questions here were to understand their movement patterns and their timing, to understand their exposure to poultry at this wild bird domestic bird interface and to understand their movements in relation to known outbreaks. And so our work began in China and we were able to acquire some very interesting results there. But as this program developed, we received um, significant support from the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization because they had an interest in understanding these types of questions, not only where the H5N1 virus emerged, but also where there were zones of endemic infection or persistence within this part of the globe. And so we were able to broaden the program to mark a large number of birds, you know, more than 650 in 12 different countries. And prior to this work, there was pretty much no movement data available. There were some, depending where you were, some infrequent band records, band re-encounters that were providing the information on migratory connectivity of wild bird species. And so I'm gonna do a very broad overview on this. What did we learn? So we, we had a very large number of papers that came out of all these different studies and worked um, quite closely with international colleagues. So some of the things that we learned were new migratory connections. So here's Qinghai Lake, here's bar-headed goose, which was one of the, the birds that more than 3,000 out of the 6,000 birds in that first outbreak died. We uncovered a new migratory connection between Qinghai Lake 
and Lhasa, which is the capital of Tibet. This is all up on the Qinghai Tibetan Plateau. There's really very few poultry up here in the Qinghai Lake area, but down here where they're actually in the capital, where there actually are some humans, there is some poultry. And what was significant about these findings was one, this connection was not known before. Two, we were also able to see that movements of these birds between the wintering areas and the Qinghai Lake breeding areas or migratory stopovers could happen within a short period of time. Some of the, the shortest movements were around five days, which is within the asymptomatic period of that was identified in challenge studies for bar-headed geese based on the H5N1 high path virus. So what did this tell us that perhaps bar-headed geese may be a potential vector and be able to move virus if it could survive it between these poultry infected areas and the remote wildlife refuge and those <clears throat> types of situations. Looking broadly across a large data set, we were also able to find patterns across the different species with waterfowl dispersal being anywhere from 300 to 1600 kilometers within that general asymptomatic period of one to four days, indicating that there may be a potential for rapid movement of high path virus during the asymptomatic period. But the findings were not necessarily clear and they're a bit more complicated, depended on what species you were looking at, depended on what areas you were, you were looking at. So we also found in trying to explore this connection of wild birds and poultry and who may be moving the virus, we found some temporal mismatches between outbreaks and when the wild birds might arrive meaning that in some of these locations, it seemed that poultry were more likely the, the path for transmission and spread. We found that within Korea and parts of the East Asian flyaway, which connects um, the Eastern part of China up through Korea and Japan and parts of the Northeastern bits of Russia. And then there were some phylogenetic studies that use really important virus data and genetic relatedness to try and hypothesize movements of virus. Some of these studies, however, had hypothesized movements of virus by wild birds between different regions. And my main point here is that some of the work that we were able to uncover debunk some of these hypotheses, meaning that if you learn about the avian host ecology, some of these movements would not be supported by wild birds. And so the main lesson here is that it's really important for us to understand more and dig deeper um, into the host ecology of the wild birds. So all of this information was used to help support interface transmission risk models within China. And so these were density dependent, meaning it depends on how many wild birds and domestic birds you have on the landscape and environmental transmission. <clears throat> so it looked at waterfowl, waterfowl weighted risk factors. So here we've got populations of waterfowl weighted by their prevalence estimates across different taxonomic groups, their viral shedding rates, as these being the shedders for avian influenza virus and the poultry being those that are being susceptible in, in uptake. And so on the poultry side, we had to split out the domestic, sorry, the aquatic poultry and the terrestrial poultry because of the biosecurity factors are so different between them. And so the model output here showed really large differences across different seasons, across different geographic regions within China, showing the importance of understanding the movement patterns and the susceptibility of wild birds at this interface. So what about our part of the world? In December 2014, virus moved into, high path descendant viruses moved into the Pacific Flyway of the U.S. that caused major economic uh, losses, loss of 50 million chickens, millions of dollars. So we need tools to help managers respond and detect early detections in, the, in these threats. 
So I was interested in developing these types of models for the US and looking for partners um, with expertise on the epidemiology and the poultry side and was able to develop partnership with the USDA Center for Epidemiology and Animal Health. And here together, we're mapping out base distribution models for the wild birds and distribution models for the poultry within the United States. I'll talk a little bit about some of the supporting studies that we have to understand, particularly the wild bird side. This includes challenge studies of different viral strains within different species of waterfowl, some genetic sequencing studies with our partners to understand virus evolution, to understand connectivity across geographic areas, as well as similar work that's being done, prevalence and surveillance within some of the different flyways. And these types of information feeding into better informed spatial temporal transmission risk models. So some of the base inputs are already produced with basic wild waterfowl distributions. USDA has also used a combined hybrid approach to mapping out potential farm locations across the different sectors. And now we're working on additional inputs that help us weight based on different risk factors such as prevalence, across different taxonomic groups in wild birds, across spatial flyways, seasons, and also working with uh, USDA to understand the risks for different poultry uh, farm types and farm sectors, as well as biosecurity factors. Also wanted to just mention some of the movement studies we've been able to do here with partners within the United States. There's a, a nice telemetry data set on an example, waterfowl species of blooming teal, which is an early spring migrant with connections to Mexico and South America with virology showing some H7 strain detections. And so we, we combined host ecology and virology to look at these seasonal patterns of these birds. And the, our model results indicated that the probability of an avian influenza event increased with both occurrence and residence time of the species and a higher occurrence of, of risk of outbreak on the north, northward migration. So these models were published right before the most recent high path infections were detected in the Carolinas last year, where H7N3 was detected in North Carolina and South Carolina with some uncanny connections between when the timing of the prediction of outbreak events related to the blooming teal movements, as well as the spatial locations. We're also doing some work um, in the Atlantic Flyway, looking at some of the banding connection data, as well as genetic analyses to understand connectivity among the different bird groups related to virus genetics. And we have some work done with partners as well in the Pacific Flyway. We also have challenge studies ongoing with the USDA Southeast Poultry Research Lab to understand the susceptibility, virus shedding, you know, their symptoms, mortality, asymptomatic periods of different high path even influenza strains across the particularly understudied diving duck species. And so our interface modeling is ongoing and all of these studies that I mentioned that inform us on the host ecology is helping us to develop better models. When they are developed, we will share them directly with our stakeholders, which are USDA, state and federal um, agencies, as well as the broader community. And we've got some of this up on a, a avian influenza visualization web tool where models can be, particularly for China and then upcoming for the United States, can be visualized with different layers and then also downloaded directly from the webpage. I'd like to thank all of our local and international partners and open up for questions, if I have time. Diane, thank you so much for the great presentation. I think we do have time for some questions. I see one question in the Q&A, so Diane, feel free to defer to the panel of people in this session as well, but what are your thoughts on basically the origin of the COVID-19 virus? So the question was, do you believe that this virus was initiated from a bat to a pangolin in an Asian wet market? I would defer that to, to others, but I would say that in general, the live, the live market system 
within Asia is a very important area where different wild species and domestic species are put in close contact with each other. And a lot of the evolution of these avian influenza viruses also happen within these markets. So to me, it does make sense that the evolution of the COVID virus did come. We know that they, those viruses are in wild animals and cross the border at one of these live bird markets. Thanks, Diane. Does anybody uh, else on our panel? Here we've got Ann Bowman. I have one thought, but I'll just see. Ann, did you want to add anything on that question? Otherwise, you don't have to. Otherwise, I'll just share one thought. So I'll pause for a moment. Go ahead. Ann. Yeah, thanks, Camille. The, really, the only information at this point that I am aware is, you know, the closest genetic match with the human strain of the SARS-CoV-2 appears to be, you know, the Chinese horseshoe bat. Now, whether it was, I, I don't know what all the species were present in the wild market, but I know that it was speculated that the horseshoe bats were not necessarily there. And so there was some sort of intermediate host before it jumped into humans. That's about as much information as that I'm aware of. Thank you, Anne. And I was going to say something along the same lines. So, so I'll just pause to see if there are any other questions for Diane. Diane, thank you so much. And Aunt, our next speaker is going to be Patrick Hutchins. So Patrick, feel free to start trying to share your screen. So Patrick is a geneticist with the USGS Northern Rocky Mountain Science Center. He leads the Proliferative Kidney Disease Research Project and manages NOROC's Environmental DNA Lab. Outside of work, he's a high school wrestling coach. And he's originally from Maryland. And his presentation is focused on exploration of the 2016 Yellowstone River fish kill and proliferative kidney disease in wild fish populations. So I will turn it over to Patrick. So in the Yellowstone River, just north of Yellowstone National Park, thousands of mountain whitefish began dying in August of 2016. As the cause of mortality was as of yet unknown, Montana FWP, the state management agency, closed over 400 miles of rivers and streams to all recreation, which is uh, showed uh, in red here. And this is near Bozeman, Montana, uh, Livingston, Montana. And this had significant impacts to a regional economy that is largely based on recreation tourism. Within a week of fish mortality reports, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service identified the cause of the what ended up being over 10,000 fish mortalities and that was a mixozoan parasite of salmonid fish called Tetracapsuloides bryosalmone, or as we affectionately call it, T. bryo. It has a complex life cycle involving two hosts, an invertebrate bryozoan shown on the left and salmonid fish shown on the right. Between these two host-bound phases are sporogonic phases uh, that are released into the water column by each uh, sequential host that obligately infect the other host. So if they were released from fish, they obligately infect bryozoans. And if these spores are released from bryozoans, they obligately infect fish. Um, it's important to note that fish are capable of harboring persistent infections of this parasite, but can remain perfectly healthy and asymptomatic. These clinical episodes of PKD are triggered by temperature stress, temperatures that we, we typically observe above 15 degrees uh, Celsius. And when temperatures reach this point, we often see renal kidney swelling and eventually death due to respiratory. And so one of the central dogmas uh, in disease ecology is that your host, the disease agent, and a set of specific conditions must be present together uh, in the same place at the same time. And we were essentially asked to figure out how these different components came together to produce the mortality event that we observed in 2016. So here are a selection of hypotheses uh, that were put forth at the time. The first one, and probably the, the most alarming to residents and to the management agency is the, the concern that this was a new introduction. In other words, in the past, the conditions and the hosts were present, but the parasite itself was introduced to the water body. And that's what resulted in what we saw in 2016. 
another theory is that unprecedented environmental conditions were, were what led to the outbreak. And in this case, hosts and parasite would be present in the past, but the outbreak uh, was caused by the conditions of becoming you know, extraordinary. And lastly, there was concern that maybe there were changes in bryozoan populations where conditions, the fish host and the parasite were all present, but there was some new key bryozoan host factor. And, you know, this is a very reasonable uh, hypothesis to come to because we essentially know nothing uh, about bryozoans in the water column or in, in the, the Yellowstone River. And so the first thing we did to try and address these questions uh, was, by, was to develop a specific and sensitive molecular assay to be used in quantitative PCR. And we, we first wanted to address what I, I said was perhaps the most alarming hypothesis, with, which was this new introduction. So with Montana FWP, we set out on a, a, a large scale fish sampling effort and we captured and lethally sampled fish from all over the western part of the state where salmonid uh, populations exist. And what we saw was uh, really surprising. Basically, everywhere that we looked for T. bryo infections in fish, we found them with some prevalences in, in sampled fish at those locations as high as 80. It's notable that really the only places we did not observe T. bryo infections in fish uh, were in Yellowstone National Park itself, which is right on the southern central border of Montana, uh, represented in those two green circles. So this evidence essentially points to this is very unlikely to be a recent infection or a, a recent introduction uh, into the Yellowstone River, just based on how broadly distributed this parasite is in the region. And then to sort of uh, hammer that point home, I was able to use this molecular tool to go back into archived fish tissue samples that were preserved in histology blocks collected from the Yellowstone River in 2012. And I was able to find evidence of fish infections as far back as 2012. So the host and the parasite were clearly in that system prior to 2016. So then we started to ask ourselves, okay, perhaps it was unprecedented environmental conditions. And sort of a busy slide, so I'll, I'll try and outline it a little bit. The top two panels are showing discharge anomalies, so the amount of water that is actually flowing through a particular water body. The bottom two panels are water temperature in degrees Celsius, and our x-axes are just basically the, the summer months, the, the hotter months. The left two panels, what we're doing is we're just isolating the Yellowstone River and looking over multiple different years. On the right two panels, we're looking at just 2016, but comparing rivers that all uh, occur in the South Central Montana region. So starting back on the left, just looking at the Yellowstone River all over multiple years, if it looks like you're kind of losing the signal of the Yellowstone River, which is highlighted in red with a couple other notable years, 2017 and 2007, which were also hot and dry, we sort of came to the same conclusion that there is really nothing spectacular about the environmental conditions uh, in the Yellowstone River compared to other years, other similarly hot, dry years. So the conditions appear to have been present there before. And then furthermore, if we just look at 2016, where the outbreak was only observed in the Yellowstone River, again, highlighted in red, the Yellowstone River sort of seems to be experiencing the same conditions as other regional rivers where it turns out both host and parasite are present. So clearly environmental conditions alone could not explain what happened in 2016. And then the last hypothesis that I'll, I'll mention are changes in bryozoan populations. And I, I wish I had more I could say here, but it turns out that these are really elusive critters uh, in our system. But it's our hope at some point to determine the bryozoan distribution and diversity in the Yellowstone, determine the principal bryozoan host species for deep bryo, and then hopefully advance some molecular tools that we've already started developing to, to monitor those populations. But you know, after we examined these various hypotheses, it became very clear that we knew so little about where our parasite occurred in space and time along the Yellowstone River. And so we established a surveillance 
plan. Yeah, so this is just sort of highlighting that the, the only uh, hypothesis that we really couldn't eliminate outright were rhizoan populations. So <clears throat> we took a, a multifaceted approach to try and monitor what was going on with our parasite uh, in the Yellowstone River. And we largely did that with eDNA sampling, fish tissue sampling, and then an attempt at bryozoan surveys. The eDNA sampling, our hope was to get at spore release timing and perhaps even correlate that with some local environmental variables and get a sense for what the infection potential was at various places along the Yellowstone River. And then we also did tissue sampling, both of wild caught fish and sentinel cage fish, where we, we held naive fish in a cage to see what perhaps the timing of infection was. And then with the, the wild fish, the hope was to just get a sense of prevalence. In other words, draw that link between spore availability in the water to actual infection in fish. And this map is just showing our, our various point sampling sites. We've added four more for this year, and those would be the downstream four on the Yellowstone River, Mayor's Landing, Highway 89 Bridge, Pig Farm, and Springdale. The other sites, both on the Yellowstone and Madison River, we've been monitoring since 2018. And we added the sites on the Madison River largely because we wanted to get a representation from a contrasting flow regime because the Yellowstone River is an unregulated stream. There are no dams. There's no regulatory body controlling how water moves down that uh, valley. But in the Madison River, the opposite is true. There are several reservoirs there. So we were very interested to see if there were any differences between flow regimes since the primary host of our parasite is a sessile invertebrate that requires, you know, requires substrate. And so within the eDNA sampling, again, we took sort of a three-pronged approach where we have a system of discrete shore-based samples where we walk up, grab bags of water, and then pump them through filters for our eDNA. We also, every month in the summer, embarked on transect thalweg sampling, so the thalweg just being the center of the stream where water is flowing fastest, to try and get a, a snapshot, a, a large-scale snapshot uh, of what is going on in the river as a whole and hopefully get some spatial information out of that. And then lastly, to sort of check our other two methods, we were able to deploy a robotic sampling that I think Adam was talking about earlier in this day to check ourselves to see if we were missing anything that was more fine-scale temporal. And our hope was to combine all of these to try and describe some of those spatial temporal patterns in parasite abundance in the water. And so if we just start with our manual grab samples, shore-based, this is what we have seen over the past couple of years. First of all, our, our axes again on the X are just time broken up into panels based on year. The left Y axis is uh, mean daily water temperature and those correspond to the gray lines that are seen in each panel. I've highlighted the, the outbreak periods for multiple years. So the largest one was in 2016. There was a smaller fish kill in 2017 and a, another smaller fish kill in 2020. So those time windows are sort of highlighted in pale red. Over on the right y-axis is our detection rate for our grab samples. And I've just collapsed this by month, but we were going out there and taking samples at each one of those locations shown in the previous sample site map every week. So we see from those grab site samples that we have this apparent early to mid-summer peak in detection, rising up through May, falling after July. And that pattern is more or less repeated throughout the years that we sampled, though the signal seems to have moved somewhat in 2020 to be later in the season. But there's also, aside from the, the seasonal pattern, there's this annual declination in our detection rate uh, going down every year since we started doing this. And that's been the case for both the Madison and the Yellowstone. So we have apparently both a, a seasonal and an annual pattern. Uh, we might start seeing uh, further signal decay uh, from those outbreak years, 2016 and 17. So it'll be interesting to see what we see this year, given that there were fish mortalities last year. For our thalweg sampling or our float samples, again, this is just getting in a boat, starting far upstream, and then taking water samples every two kilometers as we float downstream. 
And that's what's shown here in these heat maps. So each panel is a separate year, 2017, 18, and 19. And then the direction of flow going from upstream to downstream is top to bottom. The colors of each heat map panel, the lighter colors are higher detection in those samples and darker colors are lower detection or no detection uh, is the darkest color. So in 2017, we saw a pretty clear spatial pattern of increasing a frequency of detection just downstream of where the 2016 high mortality zone is. And then again, as we travel through time, each, each sub subsequent year, we saw decreasing detection, again, kind of mirroring the results that we saw with our grab samples, our discrete sampling. And, you know, I wish we had continued floating a little bit further for some of these because the 2017 and 2020 mortality zones occurred between River Mile 500 and 480, which you'll notice are just below the axis. So we, we haven't, we, we don't have data to really see the potential of that signal moving spatially, but we, we think that that's a strong possibility and we're going to continue doing this and extending our, our survey efforts downstream this year. And then our robotic sampler sort of showed that we weren't really missing anything with our other two uh, sample efforts. So again, date is on the y-axis, the proportion of positive technical replicates or just detection of our, our organism on the y-axis. The ESP robotic sampler efforts are shown in sort of the salmon color and our manual grab samples are shown in turquoise. And you can see that generally whenever we had an ESPA, the ESP sample uh, detect a positive, we also uh, saw that mirrored in our manual grab samples. So this was just a good confirmation that our, our schedule and our system appeared to be working. And those ESP samples were, were being taken multiple times a day. So it's a very fine scale uh, temporal resolution on that data. And so what all of this has brought us to is sort of this perfect storm hypothesis where we saw multi-year low discharge and high temperature conditions that were a setup for the following, because both 2016 and 2015 were, were rather hot and dry in terms of conditions experienced by fish in the river. And so what this probably did is increase the abundance and density of bryozoans. And when bryozoans are doing well, so is their parasite. So that increased parasite proliferation. This also probably increased the interaction between fish and the bryozoan, which probably led to increased transmission. And then finally, it's sort of the straw that broke the camel's back were the conditions experienced in 2016, where they were quite hot and dry. And this, uh, this temperature stress triggered the onset of disease symptoms in what is a particularly temperature sensitive species. And then since then, we've seen colder, higher water, higher flow years that perhaps are resulting in a reduction of bryozoans may be reflected in our signal decay. And then 2018 and 19, there just probably was not that temperature stress to trigger disease in fish. And so it's very large effort. So I wanna make sure to acknowledge uh, all the people involved with it. I'm very grateful to all these folks for, for what they've done for the project. We certainly could not have done it without them. And with that, I'll take questions if there's any time. Patrick, thank you so much. I think we have time for one question. I don't see anything in the Q&A. So I'll just pause for a moment to see if there are any questions for Patrick. So it looks like, is there any evidence that T. Brio poses risk to trout? Yes. So salmonid fish in, include trout species. So the Yellowstone River is host to rainbow trout, brown trout, Yellowstone cutthroat trout. And there were instances of all of those fish, each one of those fish species dying in the 2016 mortality event, but the numbers were 99.9% .9 mountain whitefish. So a T. bryo does definitely pose a risk to trout. And this is, this is something that Europe has been experiencing for, for quite a long time. It can also wreak havoc in hatcheries. So if it, it, uh, gets loose in hatcheries and they're unable to control temperatures adequately, it could cause problems for commercial fisheries too. Thanks, Patrick. And we're short on time, but 
Patrick, there is a question in the chat. So if you wouldn't mind responding in the chat to that. So thank you so much for presenting today. And if you're, well, first, Patrick, if you can stop sharing and then Anne, if you want to start sharing. Our final presenter is Dr. Ann Ballman. Ann is a wildlife disease specialist and field epidemiologist at USGS's National Wildlife Health Center in Madison, Wisconsin. She's been at the health center since 2008. She earned her DVM at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, and her PhD in comparative medicine population health at North Carolina State University in Raleigh. She's actively involved in research and multi-agency coordination for bat white nose syndrome, and she serves as the lead for the white nose syndrome diagnostic working group, as well as on the white nose syndrome national coordination team. And her presentation today is titled A Tale of Two Tools white nose syndrome surveillance. And thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you, um, Camille, for the invitation to speak today. And like others, I really want to acknowledge the many people, both state and federal agencies and university collaborators who have um, contributed to the understanding of this uh, emerging disease of bat white nose syndrome over the years. So my talk today, I'm going to be focusing on discussing two tools. And I will describe the evolution of these that were used to develop to assist um, the early detection of white nose syndrome, the causing fungus, which is pseudogymnoastic destructans, which I'm going to shorten for the remainder of this talk to PD. One is an ecological diffusion model used to predict the spread of PD, allowing more strategic deployments of limited surveillance resources. And the other tool is the addition of environmental guano sampling in surveillance guidance tool. So for those of you who may not be as familiar with white nose syndrome, first a little bit. White nose is the predominant threat to bats in North America. It was first recognized in 2006 near Albany, New York. It's caused by the cold-loving fungus ED that grows on uh, skin of bats during winter hibernation and, for, and it continues to do so for a few weeks after emergence and often kills more than 90% of bats at infected hibernation. It's believed to have originated in Europe and has been introduced here, hypothesized to be introduced here through uh, contaminated gear, caving gear. It's rapidly spread predominantly through bat to bat or environment to bat transmission, although there is potential evidence, again, that humans can inadvertently move the pathogen around. And the fungus has been now in 40 states as well as seven Canadian provinces with the most recent detections um, this season being reported in Montana and New Mexico. Of the 45 bat species found in North America, the disease has been confirmed in 12 species, 10 of those which are in the genera myotis, as well as tricolored bats and big brown bats. And the fungus has been detected on six additional species, as well as two subspecies of bats in North America. So about 40% of um, the North American bat species have uh, been found to be uh, affected or uh, at least been exposed to um, PD. And this includes several of the already endangered species. So how does white nose kill? The fungus grows on the skin of bats during hibernation and gives the characteristic fuzzy white look to the muzzles, ears and wings that gives the disease its name. Bat wings play many critical roles in bat physiology during the hibernation period, including maintaining water balance, gas exchange, blood circulation and thermoregulation. And it's natural for bats to arouse from hibernation, even when they're healthy periodically during winter. However, white nose syndrome exploits, um, exploits this and causes bats to wake up more frequently, whether it's through irritation of the fungal infection, or again, through some of the physiological mechanisms that become disrupted with the infection. The arousals are energetically expensive and causes bats to use up their limited bat reserves that are meant to sustain them over the winter hibernation period when prey is not available. And so as they're burning through their fat reserves ahead of prey availability, they can end up starving to death or prematurely emerging from uh, hibernation in search of food and becoming exposed to the cold. And biologists have reportedly, have reported early returns of bats to summer roosts um, in white nose affected areas. Additionally, affected individuals suffer evaporative water loss resulting in dehydration and um, electrolyte imbalances similar to what's been described in uh, catridial mycosis mortalities in amphibians. Heat loss is also a potential and so damaged wings in and of themselves can also compromise flight for foraging and, and predator invasion. White nose is a, is a biological threat for sure. 
It represents a, a recent study by Cheng et al. that looked at bat population impact levels based upon winter colony counts between 1995 to 2018, both pre-white nose and obviously post-white uh, nose emergence at over 200 hibernacula showed that in five North American bat species have declined um, since the emergence of white nose with northern long-eared bats, little brown bats, and tricolor bat populations being reduced by over 90%. Um, the figure in the lower right shows that white nose already occurs in approximately one-third to nearly 80% of these five particular species ranges, and it's continuing to spread. And so why does bat decline matter? Bats provide very important ecological services. They consume insects, which are in and up themselves, crop forest pests and potential disease vectors in many cases, and they're estimated to offset billions of dollars worth of insect control and ag damage. But in addition, their guano provides vital cave nutrients to maintain healthy cave ecosystems. And there are additional North American species that also serve as uh, plant, and plant pollinators and spread seeds. So with this, monitoring the spread of fungus and disease prevention is important for understanding the epidemiology and finding out effective means to mitigate the impacts on bat populations. The National White Nose Surveillance Guidance has been developed to, to identify the primary goals of detection of white nose syndrome and, and PD into new areas and identify new host species while minimizing disturbance and transmission risks. Um, at the onset of white nose emergence, when the cause was still under investigation and specific diagnostic tests were being developed, surveillance was targeted, meaning that it was focused on testing clinically affected individuals only. The strategy helped identify PD as the cause, identify species susceptibility differences, sample timing, and led to the development of rapid and highly sensitive and specific qPCR assays that expanded our options for non-lethal sampling as well as demonstrating a lag period between the time of PD detection and the actual development of the disease white nose syndrome. During this phase, it was determined that PD could exist in underground environments and even in the absence of bats. With the development of and refinement of high throughput PCR assays, PD surveillance evolved um, to the screening phase such that samples could be collected at hibernacula in the absence of clinical signs in the bat population to provide an early indicator of the pathogen presence and range expansion. And this thus provides managers with some time to implement various management actions to try to mitigate the effects of the disease. Additionally, environmental sampling was now possible by extending um, the available sampling window beyond the winter season. However, environmental detection often lags behind PD detection on bats. During this period, active surveillance kits were provided to partners with the emphasis at the disease front, shown in the middle figure there is, is the orange section, and to a lesser extent in areas both ahead and behind the front. However, kit distribution was limited to five to 10 kits per state and even fewer in at-risk regions in the blue area, as well as the red where the white nose was already endemic, and this was to accommodate equitable distribution um, based upon some presumed hibernacular risk factors that prioritize individual sites at state level and was not necessarily conducive for a broad regional scale interpretation or, or coordination. And thus, these limitations led to the next um, iteration of PD surveillance, which was design surveillance. So with that, the design surveillance addresses the needs of a more strategic approach for early detection of white nose syndrome and, and PD expansion into new geographic an opportunistic identification of new susceptible bat species making the most of limited field and lab resources. In 2018, improvements to the surveillance guidance sampling design were pursued because managers had expressed um, a desire for more detailed guidance and better coordination across political boundaries. And prior again to this, the active surveillance kit distribution was really only providing site level information and could not really provide larger scale robust, robust um, inference about the extent of PD presence or absence in a region. So the goals of design surveillance were to apply data-driven sampling design, which allows for better coordination among the states and complements um, the national white nose surveillance plan surveillance goals. And our objectives here, with, again, with design surveillance are to reduce the time to detect pathogen spread into new geographic areas, while making the most efficient use of limited resources, providing the timely information to managers to help slow the spread of the disease and coordination of efforts across jurisdictions. And there are quite a few partners then that are served by a more strategic approach. So I um, should 
let folks know I am not a modeler. So this was a collaborative effort and it was done. There's a strategic PD surveillance advisory team, which was an 18 member team um, comprised of um, representatives from multiple state and federal management agencies um, that represented multiple perspectives from areas where white nose had yet to become widespread as well as um, at the edge area. Membership also included NA BAT population monitoring coordinator as well as White Nose Surveillance Working Group lead to enhance coordination and data integration. The purpose of this team was to provide input on surveillance needs for the improved strategic design to help identify suitable data layers and sampling unit sizes to incorporate into the model and to advise the modelers on output feasibility and, and ease of use. The White Nose Steering Committee, which is part of the National White Nose Response Team, it's another multi-agency organization that helps to see that helps oversee the national response. They decided, they helped decide the primary focus of national surveillance would be to continue focusing on early PD detection and provided additional guidance on resource allocation to, to address any unmet surveillance needs identified by states. And as I was saying, I'm not a modeler. And so the university collaborators, both Kansas State and University of Wisconsin, receive this input and then work their particular magic to um, pull this together. And so the next Next, I will um, show you the schematic of what the model was. This is the model that was designed was a dynamic ecological diffusion model um, that was developed to help predict the risk of PD spread. Model uses 12 years worth of the National Wildlife Health Center surveillance data from 2008 through 2019 of both PD detections and non-detections. And as of um, last season, the data set consisted of nearly samples, or sorry, 22,000 samples, including both bat and environmental origins. The surveillance data, in combination with other landscape features, um, such as mines, cars, canopy, cover, hydrology, and terrain ruggedness, which are thought to influence both bat occupancy and thus PD diffusion, were added into the model to predict the growth rate, how fast the PD prevalence was increasing in a defined area, as well as the diffusion rate, which describes how fast PD moves into new areas. And so the output from the model itself is a map shown below, as well as Excel spreadsheet tables that provides managers with very detailed information of the high priority cells, which are based on the NABAT sampling grid, which is a 10 square kilometer grid. Again, which that details about national bat population monitoring and where bats are, are what species are occupying which areas. And it, it identifies not only the high priority cells, which are uh, indicated in the black squares in that map below, but also the larger eco sections, um, which are the colored polygons from which partners can then choose to focus their surveillance efforts at known bat congregation sites, whether it's hibernacula or summer roost sites or foraging areas. The model can uh, generate the top 25 priority cells and their associated eco sections within each state from which then partners can target their sample. This figure here shows the results of the surveillance season highlights from last year, with the, which was the first year of implementation of the strategic plan design or sampling design. And this is, shows, again, the high priority eco sections are indicated in the dark polygons, which were predicted by the model to be at risk for PD spread. The, the dark, the squares um, represent samples that were collected through active surveillance efforts that use the surveillance kits, while the circles on that map are showing um, the passively or opportunistically collected samples during last season. And the, the more muted colors in the background are showing the cumulative surveillance results from prior seasons, just to put it in um, uh, perspective of where the new detections and non-detections were occurring to what had been seen in the past. So the COVID-19 pandemic, however, was declared in March of 2020, and by April, multiple wildlife agencies had adopted a moratorium on um, direct contact of back activities out of concern for the potential reverse zoonoses and the creation of a wildlife reservoir of the virus in North America. So only about 25% uh, of the 200 surveillance kits that had been issued last surveillance season had been returned by April. So as an alternative to suspended spring trapping, 48 environmental experimental environmental surveillance kits used to collect guano and substrate swabs on that above ground summer roost were sent to partners in the priority eco sections to continue surveillance that season. And that's the next tool I'll be describing here in a moment. But the figure down in the lower hand right the dynamic model is updated um, annually with the new, with each season's uh, surveillance data. And so by using both detections and non-detections, you can see that the updated model for this um, current 
surveillance year adjusted the predicted PD front westward at the northern and southern ends of the disease front, but it shifted it eastward in the midsection due to non-detections in the state of Colorado last year predominantly. And at this stage, there's really not enough data been generated yet at this point to evaluate how well the model design surveillance performs compared to um, previous surveillance strategies that have been used. Next, I want to focus on the tool of environmental guano sampling to the National Surveillance Toolkit. So as white nose syndrome spread westward, managers expressed the need for alternative surveillance options for early PD detection because of the challenges uh, of accessing hibernacula in the west often. There's large winter congregations of the most susceptible species are much less common than they are in the eastern U.S. and or simply just don't occur in western states and the sites are more remote or difficult to access particularly in the winter months um, when the disease is most when the disease prevalence is highest and thus you know most efficient for sampling for surveillance and therefore alternative strategies for early detection were warranted in regions that faced the challenges. And the evidence that was available at the time for supporting exploring environmental guano surveillance for PD included observations microscopically of seeing PD canidia in bat guano early on in, the, in New York. Secondly, when sampling bats using contaminated caves during summer months, we had found that guano was a more reliable sample type for detecting the exposure to PD than were skin swabs. Presumably this was from grooming activity of the bats that were active in the summertime. And following a highly unexpected first confirmation case of white nose syndrome in a little brown bat in Washington state in the spring of um, 2016, which represented a nearly 2,000 kilometer leap from the nearest known PD detection that same season, fresh guano that had been accumulating at a bridge night roost over several weeks offered additional supportive evidence of PD introduction into the state when attempts to uh, capture bats around the index area were very elusive and underground entry was prohibited due to safety concerns by the state agency. And so these were examples that suggested that collection of environmental guano samples at above ground summer roosts could be used as a potential surveillance strategy. And the fact that these summer roost sites are often more accessible than winter hibernacula and collecting the samples during the summer months is much less intrusive um, to the bat populations than collecting skin swabs during um, hibernation. So the pilot study questions that we addressed in 2017 was one, could we first and foremost, could we replicate the PD detection in guano at, at um, other sites, particularly those that uh, were subject to prevailing weather conditions? Next, how long after uh, spring emergence could PD be detected in guano from above ground summer roosts? When was the best sampling window during uh, the summertime to detect PD in guano? And finally, how long could guano accumulate to increase the likelihood of PD detection? And I apologize, but we're uh, over time. So, yep. Sorry, so, I apologize for that. But no worries. Yeah, so I will just briefly um, let you know that our initial pilot studies were successful and provided evidence that we could start incorporating these. We did some expanded field trials in both 2018, which was an abject failure, but undaunted because of the success of our pilot studies. We had repeated it again in 2019 and were successful in documenting early detections using the environmental guano sampling at Summer Roos. And again, that was the impetus for we were able to be very nimble and adapt when COVID-19 struck in the 2020 season and, and use the environmental sampling kits as a substitute for uh, spring trapping samples. So I will leave it at that. We do recognize that there are some limitations, but we are continuing to move forward with looking at additional ways to use the guano in addition to not only PD surveillance, but using the same sampling techniques to explore the suitability of the sample collection for also screening for that coronaviruses in North America as well. So thank you, and I apologize for going over time. Thank you so much, and I don't see any questions in the Q&A, but if you'll just check the Q&A and chat, you know, just in the in the next couple of minutes in case someone has any questions. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Cindy Tam. Thanks to my presenters, we really appreciate it. For sure, thanks Camille. All right, um, so I've got the last talk today to close us out. And I want to thank everyone for, for staying to the last one. I appreciate that. And 
First, I want to thank all the USGS scientists who donated content for this talk. I've been out of research for quite some time, and so none of this is my research. And while I'm going to give some technical content, the part that I feel confident presenting, my primary focus is going to be on the management implication of these detection tools. And so on each slide, I've put a contact that is actually doing the work. And so if you have technical questions, it's probably best to be speaking with them. And for those of you that donated content and don't see it in here, I'm so sorry. I got lots of, of information and I just couldn't include it all. And so that doesn't mean that I don't find it important. I probably found it too difficult. <laughs> so thank you. The rise of biological threats from invasive species and wildlife disease occurrence over the past several decades is having profound economic and social impacts. It costs the country billions of dollars annually and resulting in the loss of um, livelihoods for some. And to respond to this national need for enhanced biosurveillance, uh, USGS is developing a, a national biosurveillance network. Biosurveillance is a systematic approach that addresses components of wildlife disease and invasive species introduction you see on the bottom of the slide here. Um, early warning, identifying a potential threat before it's known um, to have been introduced. Early detection of events, and this is hopefully before the species becomes established. Situational awareness is an indication of the magnitude of the threat. And then consequence management is what's an appropriate response. So all of these um, different components make up biosurveillance. And today um, I'm going to be talking about some meat work that USGS is doing on early detection. So I'm going to be addressing USGS science on detection for invasive species at two scales. The, the molecular scale using DNA, which we'll get to in a bit, and I will just give a brief overview on since we've heard a lot about eDNA already today. And then at the landscape scale, using remote sensing tools like drones and underwater vehicles and imagery from planes and satellites. So buffalo grass, pictured up there on the top left, is a perennial bunch grass native to Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. It was purposely introduced into the U.S. and other parts of the world, including the Sonoran Desert region, to provide livestock forage and mitigate soil erosion. And since then, it spread aggressively into areas that were historically occupied by sparse native vegetation. And it's increased the fuel load and intensity of a fire. So it's an invasive species that managers look to control as soon as it gets into new areas before it gains a foothold. But the terrain is difficult, as you can see in the picture there, and the areas to search are large. So several efforts to identify buffalo grass have been tried in the past using Landsat imagery and MODIS, and they have failed. And so here, USGS scientists were using hyperspectral imagery with 300 bands to detect green buffalo grass at 12 centimeter resolution. And then they trained Worldview 3 satellite image to detect buffalo grass with better success and an overall, overall accuracy of, of 93% in Saguaro National Park. And you can see on the top right there, it's buffalo grass in multispectral and hyperspectral signatures. So using that signature that they found, they're able to predict areas in the park. This is on the bottom in red that could be, that are most likely to be have populations of buffalo grass. And they're able to find small infestations to better target treatment. Similar to the previous, and that um, using a combination of imagery techniques to develop maps that will help managers target control. So here the species of concern is soapwort. It's a very difficult um, to eradicate invasive plants and they want to get ahead of it in Nasita National Wildlife Refuge before it gets out of hand. And so here there's two different types of UAS imagery that were taken. You've got true color and then a multispectral. And this was paired with a ground survey to uh, map out, to identify where soapwort was. You can see the little yellow stars there. And this is a project that's still in the works, but the idea is to be able to come up with ways, a signature to identify the soapwort using the UAS imagery. This study is about tamarisk or salt cedar, which is an invasive shrub or tree that's found across the American West. And it favors sites that are inhospitable to native stream-sized uh, plants because they'll tolerate 
salinity and low water availability and altered stream, stream flow regimes. But it's a species of concern. And so a leaf eating beetle from the Tamarisk's native range in Asia was released about a decade ago. And you can see that in the top right. And the beetle eats the leaves of the Tamarisk, leaving denuded shrubs, which you can see in the top right. And if there's sufficient pressure from the beetles, they'll eventually, the tamarisk will eventually die, but it can survive several bouts of losing its leaves. So where tamarisk is declining, USGS scientists are studying how the ecosystem responds to removal of the species. And it's important to understand, managers want to understand, in a, in a large region, are native species doing better or is tamarisk and how's that beetle doing? And so um, using some, this is UAS imagery and a vegetation index. The map in the middle was produced where, where there's a lot of yellow, that's denuded tamarisk, and the more green it is, the more native the community. And so it's a way for managers to really understand the health of the ecosystem and the areas they need to be concerned about. So this slide is, is switching gears and looking at an underwater autonomous vehicle. And you can see in the, the top left, the tube there with the yellow and black houses the cam several cameras and, and a lot of instrumentation. And this vehicle, the whole thing there, the torpedo shaped vehicle can be submerged and travel for quite some time at the bottom, well, programmable where, where they want, where the scientists want the surveying to be taken. And you can see some of the output from this autonomous vehicle. You see the raw photo in the middle and then using either human or machine learning, identifying a fish is a round goby, invasive round goby. So you can identify the fish as fish, count them, tabulate them, and do this for many, many images. And so this, this project is using some machine learning to remove the human from being able to do this sort of bottom surveying. This is an example of using imagery that was derived from thermal infrared sensor on, a, on plane flyovers, where this is the Lafitte National Historic Park and Refuge in Louisiana, where they are uh, concerned about feral hogs. So surveying was done. And when you blow up, this is uh, imagery that was taken in the early morning where there's some differentiation the most differentiation between the animals and the environment. And when you look at that little section towards the left, you can see that that is a, a feral sow and some offspring. And so by doing this type of survey, this the managers can actually do a count of the, the hogs that are in the, the refuge at any given time. This, this was just put out last week or the week before, and this is using Landsat data. And, and so this is spatially explicit data set that used satellite imagery that was current through May 3rd of this year. And it looks at exotic annual grass abundance across much of the sagebrush biome in the Western US. So this is publicly available as of very recently. <laughs> and besides being a, a pretty amazing section of the of area of the United States, it is unique in that the, the scale of this information is made available almost, not, not quite real time, but this is, this is, these are data from, from this year and it's predicting how the abundance of exotic annual grasses, the, the primary target being cheatgrass, but other species fall into that as well. This is really important for managers for a variety of reasons, but including understanding fuel loads going into fire season. So I wanna switch over and to the opposite end of the scale and, and look at molecular tools for detection that we have and, and how, how the molecular tools can uh, provide new options for managers. So we talked about eDNA quite a bit today, but that's the DNA that animals leave either in the air, or the soil, or water. And USGS has been involved in, in the development and, and improving of eDNA for quite some time. And we have done a bunch of work when it comes to zebra and quagga mussels. eDNA has been looked at for five constrictor snakes, Nile tilapia, you can see over in the top left, and four species of invasive carps. And then in the very middle, you see 
a little twirly thing on a, on a pole. <laughs> and this was a, an environmental sampler that was developed to look at, to collect spores of the causative agent of rapid ohia dust, which is a, a big problem for a, a culturally and economically important tree in Hawaii. So it's just a little bit of, of a different sort of passive, passive method for collecting eDNA. So it's something that, that we've done a lot of in, in USGS, and if we've heard in other talks, um, we're helping to managers, we're helping managers look to ways to integrate this, these sorts of information into management decisions. We've also heard some about LAMP assay, and I wanted to just, just bring up again these, these three methods where we're using LAMP, three different species, we're using LAMP assays right now. And at one example, rapid ohia death, so there was the environmental sampling that was done passively, but there's also a kit that managers can take into the field. So the method for dealing with rapid ohia death is to call the tree. And so if, when you core a tree and you're out in the middle of far away from anywhere, if you have to go back to the lab and, and do that analysis, it can be very difficult to get back. So this, this kit allows the, the manager to take a core of a tree and then determine whether or not they need to call the tree. There's another lamp assay that's been detect, developed for the Asian fish tapeworm, which is a, a, which is a big problem in the United States. And it's like, I know that red shiner out west is, is a problem, a species of concern that, that can die from, from infestation with Asian fish tapeworm. And there are other concerns as well. And so this is a way to test for the presence of, of the tapeworm in fish without having to kill them. And then we heard John Amberg speak earlier about using lamp assay at ports of entry into coming into the United States to screen for zebra mussels on moss balls and their and other aquarium products. And this would be having these detectors at ports of entry, I think, opens up all kinds of potential uses in the future. And we also heard Adam Sepulveda give a presentation on the potential of adding eDNA sampling into the USGS stream gauge network. You know, USGS has over 8,000 stream gauges across the country. You can see that in the upper left. And Adam and the folks he's working with and some other, a couple of other researchers in USGS have been, you know, testing, looking at either having people, hydrologic technicians that go out to service the gauges or robotic samplers, remote sampling done for eDNA and it looks promising as a method to, to gather some surveillance, community surveillance or, or from people or <laughs> surveillance of the invasive species or public health or wildlife health species that are of concern. And I think that Adam mentioned all of these, but they've look, used robotic sampling to look at pathogens of fish, parasites of fish invasive species, and then human health, human pathogen, the brain-eating amoeba, but used for harmful algal blooms would be a, another potential method, another potential use. So that was all that I, I wanted to, to just bring home again. These are, USGS is doing some really groundbreaking work for detecting invasives and moving that science forward. And we are, excited to, to move forward the USGS Biosurveillance Network. And we, I want to thank everyone that has participated today. It's been a lot of really interesting talks. So thank you all. And I don't know if I have questions, but I will take a look at that. Lindy, go ahead and just double check that there's uh, no more screen or no more questions in the q and I just want to uh, quickly share with the group what we have going on, the rest of NISA. First of all, I just want to say thank you and reiterate what Cindy said. This was outstanding. I learned so much and I am continuously impressed by all of you and the great work that you're doing. And I'm really grateful that you invited me and, and NASMA to participate today. So thank you so very much. I want to throw a shout out to Molly Bodie behind the scenes who's been doing tech support for us. She's a rock star. We really appreciate her help. And then just a shout out to James English who helped to plan this and isn't able to be here today because he's off 
doing the good work, helping, helping the COVID fight. So again, thanks for bringing this to us and allowing us to participate. We really appreciate it. We are going to be back on another webinar at the top of the hour, learning about aquatic nuisance species legal framework. Tomorrow, we have regulatory process for classical biocontrol. Thursday's aquatic plant management priorities. Friday is our noxious weed day, one o'clock central every day. You can register at nisa.org. And there's lots of resources there, toolkit, and all sorts of information there for you. So take a look at nisa.org and get involved in, in all that we have going on this week and share it with your friends and your colleagues for us. So with that, thank you again. Thank you, Cindy and Patrick and all every single speaker and every attendee. Normally in an event this long, the attendance goes down, but it stayed steady. So we had a great group here for the entire thing. Really appreciate all of you. Have an awesome day, and I hope that I get to visit with you again soon. Thank you so much, everybody. Bye-bye.